the Chamber just to um, maintain social distancing throughout. Uh, today we will consider subordinate legislation and we will receive a briefing from the Department with regards to the programme for government and then a further briefing from the Construction Employers Federation. Just to also remind those who are attending um, remotely um, to use the hand up icon um, to indicate if they wish to ask a question at each item on the agenda. Um, and also could I just remind um, members to mute your mics as well whenever you're not asking questions just to prevent any sort of background um, interference. Uh, I haven't received any apologies. Is there, does anyone have any apologies to everyone on screen? Ms. Liz Kittmans, okay. Okay, moving then to Chair's business item two, um, tabled at page three of your pack is the clerk's memo regarding the joint meeting with the community for the, sorry, the committee for economy and the committee for agriculture, environment and rural affairs, which is taking place on the 24th of, um, of March. So we're still a couple of weeks away from that. So if members have had the opportunity to look at that. Um, if you are content that because we will all be in attendance hopefully next week um, for the reservoirs um, briefing, that what I may just do is just take an indication for people from people at that meeting, um, just the order for speaking. Um, sort of more take it more randomly if you're content to do that. Members content with that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Grand. Um, now, the, the, there will be a challenge with, with this meeting, the fact that there are three committees anyway, um, and I'm guessing that suppose maybe some of the more obvious questions will be taken before they get to infrastructure, but I'm um, sure we can, we can play that by year I'm on, on the day. Okay, um, the next item is again tabled at page five, and it's the clerk's memo regarding the committee inquiry on decarbonisation on Northern Ireland transport. Um, if members have had the opportunity to look at that, that's on the back of the briefing which we received from research uh, last week. So we have obviously the terms of reference there, um, the methodology for the research, and then there's also uh, a time frame um, with the hope that this would then be completed by um, summer recess. Do members have any comments on that? Content to agree? Yeah. 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 Generally Good. content with the direction of travel with regards to that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just another issue, just while I'm while I am talking, um, it's come to my attention in relation to the planning review, and I know all members have an, have an interest in relation to that. But I'm, I'm aware that councils have been given just a four-week window um, to respond to the consultation, um, which isn't which wouldn't be normal. Um, and I suppose, if, yeah, I don't know if members would have the same view as myself, that perhaps they should be allowed a little longer um, in order to um, sort of agree and to, to consider, I suppose, some of the changes that perhaps they feel um, are required. Um, I don't know whether you'd be content for to, to write to the department just to, to ask for councils to have a little bit longer in order to sort of encapsulate their, their views. Um, Ms Anderson and then Mr Boylan. And Mr. Um, I didn't realise can we have brought him in because I think we don't know. Um I do think at the minimum, Chair, there needs to be an eight week consultation with just the same as any other consultation. It used to be twelve weeks and it moved from twelve weeks to eight weeks. It certainly shouldn't move from, from eight weeks to four, so I would agree with you. No, Chair, I would support that obviously because it was part of the planning process back um back when it all started. But yeah, I think we need to take an opportunity and time to reflect exactly how the whole plan process is rolled out within council. And clearly, council is a big part to play. So I think they need a little more time to respond. And I, I would support an extension to that uh, response period. Yeah, thank you very much, Claire. I would agree with you on that. Um, I raised this with the minister in the chamber on Monday, and she detailed the very short time scale, and then she'll be bringing something to the committee for summer recess. 
Um, now we're all looking forward to the summer, hopefully, and things will get better, but it's, it's still far away away. So there's still, there's time scale there to allow this to be extended. And I think it's important, as Martina has said, that it's at least eight weeks. We need to ensure that all feedback is being elicited. And also we need an assurance from the department that that will be properly considered and taken on board. This can't be a light touch review. We need to be, make sure that the feedback is elicited and people are given a chance to to come back. So I've written to the Minister on Monday and I think that if the committee could write in the line with what you've said, I think that would be very useful. Yeah, I think my, my concern was obviously this has been a long time coming and we were all aware that there are um, various issues with different aspects of the, of the planning system. And I think if it's to be meaningful, I think that there should be adequate time. And no doubt council councils will have been will be aware of, of, of some of the issues, but I suppose it's just about collating that um, properly and then um, reflecting that back um, in a way that's going to make a difference. Mr Beggs. Uh, so, sorry, it's, it's just going back in the previous terms of reference. Uh, uh, it's about, it, it's mentions made of ultra-low vehicles emissions. I'm content with it, provided that also includes electric vehicles. I am uncertain of the exact terminology. I'm aware that it certainly talks about new technology for um, um, diesel and petrol uh, vehicles, but it's also important to include electric vehicles in our uh, terms of reference. So I, I'm just thinking clarity, does uh, the ULEV include electric vehicles? Yeah, we, we, that was part of the discussion that we did have last week that um, members were concerned that it was just electric vehicles. So um, I think we agree. Well, I'm also concerned that it's, it doesn't eliminate electric no, vehicles. No, I, th I think it's about trying to sort of encapsulate um, and include hydrogen and so on as well. So it was to be sort of more in all encapsulating, if that was if that's correct, um, just to ensure that it you know, it wasn't just electric vehicles, so um, we can we can we can say that to um, research anyway. But I suppose that okay. that's that was that was the purpose of that. I understand. Um, so generally, then, just to go back to the other point, then with regards to planning, then members are are content that we write um, to the minister just to to ask for a longer response time for councils, um, and obviously just to ensure that this is a a meaningful review. Uh, I think for councils, by the way, Chair, I think it's for stakeholders just to give them a chance to come in. Yeah, yeah, cheers. Yeah, All right, sorry. Okay, members content? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, move, and you're, and you're um, moving then to draft minutes item three, which is page six. So that's for the meeting of the 24th of February. Our members wow. agreed. Okay. Um, Item four, matters arising, uh, page 14. We have the matters arising from the meeting of the 24th. Um, if you have any issues, um, I suppose we'll see it. There's a number of pieces of correspondence um, that obviously um, reflect back on last week's meeting as well with regards to um, us and coach operators. Um, and I suppose there, there are still ongoing concerns in relation to that. Um, and I understand that now there, there may be a meeting received today, but certainly uh, my understanding is that there hasn't been any um, further engagement with the, the bus and coach operator sector um, since our meeting last week. Um, and I suppose it would be useful perhaps for us um, to follow up on that. Um, and also perhaps if members are content that you know, if, if to follow up really on the item with regards to rolling support um, from April onwards. Do I have members have any comments with regards to um, matters arising or outstanding requests for information? Council Boylan. Mr. Boylan. Yeah, Chair, just in I might as well cover driving how the bus and coach operators because there's an issue also in, in relation to the table papers. I mean, clearly the industry is not happy with what's going on. And, and I mean, I would, I would support that we, as a committee, write to, to the Minister. I mean, there's clearly not enough support out there. And I mean, there's questions to be asked. And if you look at the table correspondence as well in the table pack, we, we need to be looking at that. And we need to be supporting this industry because clearly there's nothing coming back. You know the, the industry feel they're not getting the right supports 
and the right measures to they feel they're not being listened to. And I mean it's something that we need we need as a committee act on their behalf. I know that um, members of the industry were very unhappy with some of the commentary that was made last week um, with regards to applications and rationale for applications and so on as well, um, which really wasn't very helpful for an industry that has um, had an incredibly difficult time for the last 12 months and is unlikely to have um, a particularly good year moving forward either, particularly if we if we look at, at uh, pathway document from yesterday. Uh, Ms. Anderson. No, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I think the, the both the bus and coach industry, you know, it's it's clear from what they have um exchanged with all of us MLAs, the information that we have received, that they know that we are acutely aware that they are not hiding from scrutiny. And like you said, uh, they were concerned, they were frustrated, and they were really disappointed at what they heard at the committee last week. And we have raised their concerns, and they have raised their concerns, but they're no further forward. Uh, they're not receiving adequate support, and the scheme is clearly not fit for purpose, Chair. And when we consider, and we raised this last week, that more than half of the Bolts and Coast operators are not even eligible for support, you know, there's only 44% of them receiving some grant. So the lion's share is not being supported and they have no income and they have mountain costs. So, you know, for them listening last week to officials, um, I think, and as I was listening to the officials, there seems to be a clear lack of understanding of the industry. And there seems to be a bit of a lack of a will to fix any problems in this scheme. And the industry, I think, will never get off its knees. And the industry employs three thousand people, uh, and the industry is crying out for help. So we've had the officials in front of us. They they have exchanged views with us. They have responded to what they've heard. So here we should discuss what else we can do, next steps, because the scheme, the second scheme, if it's designed in this in the same way as the first scheme, it's not going to be fit for purpose. And when we have only 44% of the industry receiving some grant support, then there's clearly something wrong with the scheme. Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for raising this issue. I think it's really important. Uh, and last night's announcement that the furlough scheme would be extended to September, whilst it's welcome, uh, in terms of the private coach operators, we're all very conscious that there really will be no business for them this year with no international travel. So there really is a need to be bringing forward support for them in the next financial year as well, whilst also addressing the concerns around the current scheme. Because if they don't get that support in the next financial year, then it'll be a really, really, really difficult future ahead for that industry, which we need to support so many people, including our tourism industry. So I think it's important these issues are raised. Uh, I also agree that it's important that we um, continue to engage uh, with the industry and with the, the officials to try and get improvement. Um, as others have indicated, uh, certainly the, the first part of this year is, is going to be very, very difficult um, and the likelihood there will be minimal international travellers, but yet we want to ensure that there, are, there is a coach industry uh, still alive and ready to respond and facilitate tourism uh, once we, we get through the, the current difficulties. Okay. So, well, if members are, I don't think anyone else. Oh, sorry, Liz. Oh, sorry, thanks, Chair. No, it's just, uh, obviously we, we receive correspondence from the, from the bus and coach operators, um, and I know it's not in the pack that I can see yet, but they said about, they'd asked for a meeting with the department and they expressed a disappointment with the lack of engagement. Um, and by inviting committee members to a meeting with the sector. Can we get clarification whether the department is facilitating this? Because I think it's really important um, at this stage, the fact that we're on the second scheme and they're still, they're still really unhappy with that. So just to try and get some clarification around that. Okay. Well, if, if members are content, then we will we write to the, to the minister, just, um, I suppose, reiterating our concern in relation to the fact that there has been no further engagement um, with the sector since last week's meeting.
um, maybe ask if she is minded to make any amendments to the proposals for the scheme which we heard about last week. Um, and also, given the fact that we're now in March, um, ask her to advise really of her intentions um, with regards to a programme of rolling support um, sort of moving forward then um, for the summer period, um, just to well, just to ensure that they do avoid um, hardship. And uh, as others have said, that there is a, there is an industry um, once um, we move out of um, the pandemic. So if you're content that, that we do that and we raise that in, um, in, in that manner. Okay, thank you very much. Any other um, matters that members um, would like to, to raise coming out of last week's meeting? Okay, and obviously then we ha also have our, our table for outstanding committee requests. So there, there are some which are considerably overdue, and there have, as you see, there have been a number. Of, there have been reminders have been sent to them. Okay, moving then to correspondence. Uh, just draw your attention to the memo at page 28, and also tabled at page 8. Um, if members have any that they wish to um, indicate or draw attention to, um, I just. I suppose want to discuss maybe very briefly with regards to the Committee for Justice and call for evidence on the protection from stalking bill. Um, now, obviously, not really over the detail of what that may be, but I do think that um, infrastructure does play a significant part in creating safe spaces. Um, and I, I just, I suppose, look for the indulgence maybe of the committee, maybe just to, to make contact. Um, with the department, just obviously their comments with regards to the bill, but also just in relation to um, to looking at opportunities for creating um, maybe sort of green spaces, but also spaces that are, are, are well lit. And I think we'll we'll all all have those areas in our in our own constituencies, perhaps maybe where there have been LED schemes have moved in, they've maybe uh, they've mo they've maybe moved or um, created dark spaces. Um, which will then obviously make those safe as that those spaces essentially unsafe. But suppose it's just about being being mindful, I suppose, of some of the infrastructure projects um, and just for them to just consider safe spaces um, whenever they're developing um, some of their schemes and their projects. I don't know if there are members of any other comments maybe on, on that or if you're in agreement with that. Okay. Anyone else any any um, items of correspondence. Um, there was also the, the minister's response to our issues um, from the meeting of the 10th of February, where she said that she regretted that we were disappointed in relation to um, the bus and coach operator scheme. Anybody, anything else, this, Mr. Muir? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Just in terms of that, um, Follow up correspondence in terms of the meeting on the 10th of February, which is page 67. Um, on point 13, it mentions the whole issue with regards to MOTs, and it says DVA will issue a reminder notice to the registered keeper of the vehicle before the expiry period ends with instructions to how to rebook a test. Um, I've been contacted by a number of people where that hasn't been the case. People have been getting very short notice and struggling to get an MOT before the expiry. Also, there's just a general confusion around the situation where people are booking the MOT before their TEC expires, uh, but then the TEC has been extended, and there's a whole thing about getting that appointment cancelled and refunded and all the rest of it. But the most important thing is people are given significant advance notice if they need to get an MOT so they can make an appointment and get that booked. And uh, The whole system at the moment is bedeviled with confusion and last minute notifications or no notifications, and people are struggling to get MOTs booked. We also have the reality here that the COVID-19 restrictions are going to be in place for the next number of months, at least in any, you know, whatever form they take. So there is a real need for the department to be considering extending the TECs beyond the 12 month period, because as we know, the number, you know, it was the TECs were issued um, very soon this time last year as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we need a, a clear plan from the department around how they're going to manage the situation. 
and also to deal with the problems in terms of people getting late or no notifications. So I think we need to raise this with the department quite urgently, really, to be honest. No, I think you know, I've, I've also been um, contacted by a number of people with regards to MOTs, and the issue will, will obviously be too if they aren't online quickly enough, that they're not able then to access an appointment, um, mm. which then causes particular stress, particularly if they're maybe not au fait with um, the online system either. So it creates a quite a, a lot of anxiety. Um, both members are content that we write to the department just in relation to MOTs and how they're going to address the issue of, of appointments. Anyone else in relation to the correspondence? Mr Beggs? Hello there. Um, I, I agree there's a problem there. And again, I highlighted this um, recently and asking questions, etc. The, the difficulty is that there is this in, insufficient notice being given to people. Um, we're told they're being given a letter five weeks away. Uh, and again, others have contacted me to say that uh, when they then went to try and book a test, they weren't able to do so in the period. Um, uh, so we, we've made that issue, made the department aware of that issue already. Uh, what I want to know is what the department are actually going to do. Uh, we haven't had any feedback. Uh, how they're going to facilitate um, uh, anyone who has to have uh, uh, an MOT. Now, this is quite important because this, ultimately this can mean people have to take their vehicles off the road, um, unable to, to use it to get to work, um, and, and potentially even then be inflicted with uh, 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 having to uh, sewn it, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, it's quite complicated and it's important that sufficient notice is given if people are being required to have an MOT and there is clarity about this issue. Okay, so agree we contact her in relation to that. There's also an issue in that piece of correspondence from her with regards to hauliers where she's quite um, definite in that the difficulties and financial costs are not related to the COVID um, pandemic. Now, it was my understanding that not all, that all, that all non-essential um, businesses were essentially closed at the moment, so that in itself will have had an impact on on hauliers, um, and it certainly isn't what either the trade organisations and the Secretary of State have, have said with regards to COVID uh, and the impact on business. Um, so I'm not sure whether if members are content that we maybe um, um, challenge that comment. Um, we know this has sort of been a long-running saga with regards to the committee asking for support for hauliers and, and nothing has come forward. Um, but I think to dismiss it as not a COVID-related issue, I think, it is, is very unfair. Mr Boylan? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just just two quick points. Um, obviously, got the car MOT last week, so just... I to declare that and put that on record. I mean, obviously, we I was talking to some of the people, like DVA officials down there on the ground, are trying very hard to get those through the MOT, and I want to put it on record my thanks to them for the work they're doing. But the other issue I want to bring up was in correspondence in relation to page 68 about taxi operators. And I know there that they've availed of one grant support scheme or other, but, the, you know, I, I think we need to be writing back to the minister. I don't think the minister has addressed the needs of the sector. And I, I would like committee support to write back to the minister to look at addressing those needs and looking at a specific scheme because there's clearly operators out there who's missed out, and and I would like I'd like to go back to the minister in relation to it to see what would, you know, whether we could look at some sort of scheme to, to facilitate them. Sure. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Um... And then I suppose there's another point in relation to the, the Minister's correspondence on page 70, item 10, on, that she's indicated with regards to, to staffing levels. I think we, we were asking about whether what recruitment was going to be undertaken within the department, um, and that hasn't um, been addressed, I suppose, in the response. Um, so if, if we could get some more information with regards to that, because I, mean, I think we were fairly clear when... Um, roads were with us that there was an issue just in relation to the capacity and to deliver on, on on schemes and that hasn't been addressed mr beggs
Mr. I can't hear you, Mr. Baggs. Sorry, Mohammed Reels from the previous issue. So are members generally content with everything that has been said during that that item? And the suggestions which have been made? Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you're if you're content then sorry. Okay, Ms. Anderson and then Mr. Boylan. Um Chair, when the officials were in front of us and we had asked about the number of staff that had failed of the um voluntary redundancy scheme. Um, at the time, I understood that you couldn't avail of it. It was going to leave any kind of a gap or capacity uh, within a particular part of your departmental sort of any of the agencies. And it would appear that in terms of road service, they're telling us that there is a capacity issue. And I'm just wondering, is there any link between those staff that had failed of that? Because if that had been the case at the time, had it been known, then it wouldn't have been able to uh, take take forward in the way that it was. So I would just like more information, more research done on that, if we could, just to see if there's any connection between those that was able to avail of that scheme. And then if we have ended up with a capacity issue and a consequence of that, that we're having to go to external bodies uh, to get work done, consultancies and other, you know, we're having to spend more money uh, getting getting work done than what would have been previously the case if we had had staff in place. Although that's, that said, that scheme was from 2014 and they were seven years down the line. And I suppose there, there are different challenges now today than there were then as well. And no doubt that during that period of time, there'll be other there may have been others who have retired and yeah, um, there's moved. There's an audit report as well. Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Hildage maybe would like to... It's, un it's, it's under scrutiny by the Public Accounts Committee at the minute and it's a real problem throughout the civil service and in particular certain departments as well. So th there, is a, there is an issue identified there and it's going to have to be rectified pretty soon. I think probably whenever they are sort of more public facing um, Roles as well. I suppose that makes it um, much more difficult to. Miss, are you concluded, Mrs. Miss Anderson? Yes. Okay, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and appreciate the the point you raised about capacity. Uh, I've sat in the chamber there, like many others, listened to the debate on budgets there over the last two days, and and people were saying about um, you know, we didn't bid for this and didn't bid for that. The the key question then. I'd like to go back to the department relation this. The work capacity issues uh, within the department to deliver some of the projects in relation to road maintenance. And I mean, we'd like to find out more specifically what those those issues are because I've talked to contractors on the ground and, and it was indicated that they're briefing that maybe those issues with getting contractors, there wasn't issues with contractors. So we need to find out exactly um, what the capacity issues are. I don't think this committee, and I've said this before, would have any issues in relation to if the department lacked capacity, I don't think there'll be any issue with us as a committee supporting um, them and ascertaining those, uh, those capacity or addressing those capacity issues. So we need to, we need to delve in more and write to, write to the department and see where the lack of capacity is and, and see can we address it for the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, members, anything further on that item? Ms. Kimmins? Sorry, Chair, things are jumping from one to the other here. It was just on the, on the point you made about the hauliers again um, in relation to you know, support being provided. I mean, it, again, and it's, I've said it time and time again, it goes against what, what the calls from the sector have been that they do need support. So um, I certainly would support us going back to the Minister on that again um, in terms of COVID support. And, and I suppose, I, I'm not sure what way the situation is now, but I think certainly to, to revisit that because there's still quite a number of them are, are struggling um, and trying to get through that period. Okay. Content we conclude that item. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to item six, uh, subordinate legislation, so there are SL ones which are not subject to assembly proceedings. So at page 105 with SL1 parking and waiting restrictions in Crumlin order. Northern Ireland 2021, and at page 107, with SL1, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions Londonderry Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. 
So uh, two proposals for statutory rules, setting new parking and waiting restrictions in um, Crumlin and Londonderry. In the Estill ones, the department has set out the details of the new parking and waiting times and the reasons for the changes. The proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Okay. Item 7, uh, SL1, the Planning, Development, Management, Temporary Modifications, Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and you'll find that at page 110. The proposal is subject to negative resolution procedure. The proposal is for an additional ex extension um, to the extension considered and agreed by the, depart by the um, committee at SL1 stage on the 30th of September 2020, during which the committee received a briefing and at SR stage on the 7th of October 2020. The department proposes to bring forward these regulations which amend the Planning Development Management Regulations Northern Ireland 2015 to further extend the emergency period to the 30th of September 2021 during which the requirement for a public event as part of the consultation stage for major developments will be temporarily removed. The 30th of September 21 date will be kept under review, taking account of any changes to the public health advice to consider if an extension or reduction to the emergency period would be appropriate. Um, it's not the department's intention to extend the provisions any longer than absolutely necessary. Now, we have officials sort of waiting if you have any questions with regards to that. Members of any... Sure. Mr Boylan? No, Chair. I don't mind agreeing with it, but, but we as a committee just need to keep an eye on it and keep informed of, of the type of applications that are going through and what, you know what I mean? As long as you keep an eye on it, I don't mind it going through today. You know? do, you want, do you want to speak to officials? Well, well if they want to come in for a minute, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Have um, Aaron Kennedy and David Doherty in the waiting room. Good morning, Aaron. Morning, David. Good morning, uh, Mr. Thank Boylan. You, Chair. You're very welcome to the meeting this morning. Um, Mr. Boylan um, has. Yeah. Th thanks very much, Sharon. Thanks, Aaron. Just, Aaron, obviously, as you know, there, there was some concerns in relation to this matter, and I mean. We, we built this mechanism in for, for the very reason to give the, the community consultation their, their opportunity. So it's just to ensure that as part of the process that we, we keep an eye on things and any of the applications that have gone through and that the committee just be informed. Uh, I don't mind supporting it today, but certainly that the committee is kept updated in, in relation to some of the relevant applications that have gone through. Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, we have seen uh, what we wanted to avoid was a delay for major applications going through the system, uh, and we've been fortunate enough to see that. Uh, and uh, there are upwards of 50 major applications have proceeded through, and that's useful because it means that any um, housing issues uh, and demand for other services can be moved through the system. Uh, we haven't had any uh, concerns with, raised with us as to the involvement of, of the uh, different elements of the community consultation. In fact, some people are finding it a help that um, many of these documents that would be um, available at public meetings are now available online. Uh, people can go in and have an opportunity to see what is happening in their area. Uh, and a recent planning conference um, that was online, we've had quite a few comments that this is actually a beneficial to the planning system and it's something that we may want to look at longer term. Uh, in terms of, of public engagement, are there, are there other ways and, and additional ways of doing it as well as the as public meeting element? No, I appreciate that. I mean, that's that, like, as long as it's open and transparent and pe the majority of the people, we're not going to get everybody, to, but the majority of the people are looking in the process and we're, sure, we're ensuring that the, the process is clean and transparent for everybody out there, that's all. But I appreciate the answer. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Beggs? Um, again, I, I agree that uh, online can um, assist many people to view documents that they may otherwise have, have difficulties, uh, and it'd be good if that can continue going forward. But uh, in terms of the review period, um, we're all hopeful that things will improve 
uh, in a, a number of months time. So I'm just seeking reassurance that if um, health, health conditions uh, allow that you will not wait until uh, the full six months period before reverting to um, uh, real life public engagement. Particularly, it's particularly important for those who may not have uh, good access to online facilities. Yes, Chair, certainly that's something that we are keeping an eye on, uh, obviously bearing in mind the, the public health advice. Thank you. Okay, any other member have any issue you wish to raise? Not the stage, okay. Thank you, Irene and David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if um, members are content with the proposals, agreed? agreed. Okay, thank you. Moving then to item eight, and it's the departmental briefing um, for the programme for government. We have the briefing paper at page 114. Ansard will record this session and we'll welcome um, witnesses are all attending by Starleaf. So we'll welcome um, Liz Loughran, the Director of Transport Policy, uh, Sean Kerr, the Director of Corporate Policy and Planning, uh, John Irvine, Director of Major Projects and Procurement, and Adele Waters, Head of Corporate Policy Unit. Okay. Everyone, you, everyone's on your phone. You yes, you're all very welcome. Um, so, who is taking the lead? I am. Here. Okay, great. So thank you very much. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to brief you this morning and to listen to members' views on the Programme for Government Draft Outcomes Framework, which is currently out for consultation. I hope members have found the briefing paper useful in terms of helping to set out some of the background for the Draft Outcomes Framework developments to date. If you are content, I will focus very briefly on some of the key points outlined in the paper and then hand over to Adele to highlight some of the ways in which the department's work will help to deliver against the outcome. Adele will provide more detail in the context of some of the individual draft outcomes, but a key point to note from the outset is the extent to which modern, sustainable infrastructure is such a key building block of our social, economic and environmental well-being. The reach and depth of the department's contribution across the outcomes framework is therefore very clear. Whether it's growing a low uh, carbon neutral economy, addressing regional imbalance, protecting the environment, improving physical and mental well-being, or creating places where people want to live, work and visit. As you've already mentioned, due to the wide ranging nature of the outcomes framework work and our aim to answer as many of your questions as possible, Adele and I are also joined today by Liz Lochran and John Irvine. Liz is the Minister's Walking and Cycling Champion and Director of Transport Policy, and John is Director of our Major Roads Projects and Procurement. So what is the PFG and why do we need one? The PFG is the Executive's highest level strategic plan. Its purpose is to set the direction for joined up working across the whole of government with its partners over a multi-year horizon. Once in place, it will be an essential starting point for the planning of the business of every department. The requirement to have a PFG incorporating an agreed budget is set out in the Belfast Agreement and given legal effect in Section 20 of the Northern Ireland Act. The PFG, which is now being developed, requires not only executive approval, but also approval by the Assembly after scrutiny in the Assembly committees. New decade, new approach sets out the process and approach for developing the new outcomes-based PFG. It is developed through engagement and co-design focused on prosperity and well-being for all, based on a shared strategic direction and accountable and transparent when it comes to monitoring and progress, reporting on progress. The first stage in developing the PFG has been the development of a fresh draft outcomes framework undertaken by the Executive Office and overseen by the NICS Board. This has been based on extensive stakeholder engagement, feedback and citizen surveys. On the 22nd of December 2020, the Executive agreed to a consultation on the draft framework of outcome, consisting of nine short statements on societal well-being. These outcomes are intended to capture the range of things that experience and research that just matter most to people and where ultimately the Executive wants to make an impact. The nine draft outcomes are set out in paragraph 18 of your briefing paper, and while they are short and succinct to save time, I won't repeat them. 
But getting these outcomes and their wording right at the outset is so important if they are to provide the starting point for future long-term strategic planning by the executive. And this is the focus of the consultation exercise and the issue in which the department is very interested to hear your views. As well as setting out the areas where the executive wants to make an impact, the nine outcomes in the draft framework aim to encourage working across traditional boundaries. And that doesn't just mean working across departmental boundaries, but within the wider public sector, other partners in local government, academia, voluntary and community sector, and the private sector. Each outcome also sets out some early thoughts on associated key priority areas for departments, such as water and wastewater management, green economy, and safe, active, and sustainable transport. Under the outcome, we live and work sustainably, protecting the environment, and physical health and well-being. Under the outcome, we all enjoy long, healthy, and active lives. You will see in the briefing that the key priority areas, like the outcomes, are respons the responsibility of multiple departments, encouraging further multi-departmental boundaries. Each of the outcomes also identifies key strategies that were helped to deliver the PFG on, for example, green growth, investment, energy and climate change, the city and growth deals and an economic strategy. It is intended that the linkage made between the outcomes, key priority areas and strategies will help convey a better sense of where the executive intends to focus its attention. Public consultation on the draft outcomes framework lasts for eight weeks and closes on the 22nd of March. Consultation on the associated equality impact assessment completed by the executive office closes on the 30th of April. Consultation is intended to help the executive decide the final shape of the outcomes framework. The aim we are advised is for the executive to get to this stage by around the end of April. Following agreement of the outcomes framework, the next stage will then be to develop a range of actions that will make a positive contribution towards achieving the agreed outcomes. We are expecting to be taking forward that work in May or early June to enable a complete PFG to be brought forward before the summer. If it would be useful, we're happy to come back to the committee in a few months' time to brief you and listen to members' views on the DFI-led actions that are being developed. So hopefully that provides a useful overview of the process. And I will now hand over to Adele, who is the head of our PFG team, who will briefly explore some of the outcomes where the department would expect to be able to make a positive Im impact. And then after that, we're very happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, <clears throat> Chair, if you're content, I'll speak briefly uh, to the slides provided in our written briefing. The department's main priorities are connecting people and communities, growing the all-island economy and addressing regional imbalance and tackling the climate emergency. I'll focus on just some of the examples of how the department's work in furthering these priorities will help to deliver against the PFG draft outcomes. Slide one in members' packs is simply the draft framework of nine outcomes. The framework is intended to present a complete and balanced picture of the conditions of well-being that the executive wants to see for citizens. Uh, and this will provide the focal point for actions across the executive, the wider public sector, as well as from local government, community and voluntary groups and the private sector. Under the outcomes-based model, the choice of outcomes and how they're they are expressed is used to set the long-term direction of policy. Outcomes should be aspirational and generational. It's also important that they are described in terms which are sufficiently broad to allow for a comprehensive set of actions to bring about the desired improvement in societal well-being. In essence, the Executive Office's consultation is asking people to say whether the wording of the draft outcomes is right and to identify if there are any gaps in the outcomes. Regarding gaps, uh, Chair, uh, members will be aware that there is no longer a specific connectivity outcome in the draft framework. In the previous draft PFG, you'll remember that outcome 11 was we connect people and opportunities through our infrastructure. Uh, this change can be viewed in different ways. 
you know, on the one hand, does it suggest that because outcome 11 is no more the department's role and the contribution of infrastructure to the well-being outcomes is somehow downgraded? Or on the other hand, and, and this is picking up on, on Shan's opening remarks, is it that the extensive role of infrastructure as a critical enabler to the delivery of progress across the entire framework is now better recognised and more appropriately reflected? Uh, we would be interested to hear members' views on this point. Slide two uh, takes six of the nine draft outcomes and lists the associated key priority areas on which the department either leads or significantly contributes. We thought that it would be helpful to members to extract this information from the consultation document and present it on a single page. The remaining slides in your packs take each of these six draft outcomes one by one and list what appear from an infrastructure perspective to be the associated main key priority areas and key strategies. Also listed are some of the main DFI interventions, which subject to budget and developments on city deals will contribute to the draft outcomes. I won't go through all of the slides individually, but members have them in their packs, but just to look briefly at three of the outcomes. Uh, firstly, slide three, um, our outcome, or sorry, our economy is globally competitive, regionally balanced and carbon neutral. This outcome already underpins so much of the department's work, including water and wastewater management and the Living with Water programme, developing the Belfast Transport Hub to create more opportunities to encourage sustainable transport that connects communities, delivery of the Strategic Roads Improvement Programme, the feasibility study for high-speed rail linking Derry, Belfast, Dublin, Limerick and Cork aimed at creating a spine of connectivity across the island and decarbonisation measures to reduce transport emissions, including the rollout of zero emission hydrogen buses and battery electric buses. The main key priority here is infrastructure developing our digital energy and physical infrastructure to provide opportunities to grow business in all areas. The key strategies that will help to deliver actions under this key priority area include the investment, economic energy, green growth and circular economy strategies and the city and growth deals. Um, secondly, looking briefly at slides three and four, looking at the proposed outcome, we live and work sustainably, protecting the environment. Our health and well-being are directly affected by the quality of the environment around us, and the department shares the collective responsibility to tackle the climate emergency. By taking a green growth approach, we will better manage our resources, reducing carbon emissions to ensure our environment is protected and advanced and enhanced while achieving sustainable economic growth to create a living and working active landscape that can be enjoyed and valued by everyone. We also need to ensure our infrastructure is integrated, efficient and sustainable, and that people are encouraged to make environmentally responsible choices. Under the environment draft outcome, there are key priority areas covering the natural environment, the built environment, green economy, housing, safe, active and sustainable transport, and again, water and wastewater management. Many of the same key strategies apply under this outcome as under the economy draft outcome. Among the DFI interventions that will contribute to the environment outcome are projects with sustainability objectives such as BRT2 and the Lagan Bridge. And these types of interventions could have multiple positive well-being impacts, protecting the environment by tackling the causes of climate change and creating better places with safe and attractive linkages that promote active travel and as a result, better physical and mental health. Thirdly, and lastly, and this is just turning to the last but one slide in your packs, the draft outcome, we all enjoy long and healthy active lives. 
some of the many ways in which the department already contributes to this draft outcome are through our Greenways programme and the great things happen when we walk public information campaign. The Minister's Blue Green Infrastructure Fund is also focusing on how infrastructure and people-centred place shaping can improve the environment, help make local services more accessible and deliver benefits um, in people's physical and mental well-being. Uh, thank you, Chair. That completes my remarks and I believe the team are now happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was really very useful. Um, I suppose, really, I suppose the commentary and, and the aspiration behind um, each of the outcomes is, is, is laudable, and you know, and, and, and it reads particularly well um, uh, with regards to the desire of how we want to see um, our our communities grow um, and be sustainable. Um, but maybe it's more of a reflection of me and the fact that I've been around maybe um, so long. But so many of these projects really now are like hardy perennials, and you know, they're, they're I suppose they're maybe repackaged. Um, according to the, the aspirations and outcomes um, of a programme for government. Um, and I suppose the point that you did make, um, in, um, Adele, in your um, presentation was the, I suppose the most important aspect of this is really about the budget um, and how that really will underpin delivery of so many of these and hence why so many of them are popping up time and again because they, they then haven't been delivered. And I, I suppose really it would be useful for me to have... Um, a thought with regards to the costing of this and then um, and how this will be delivered um, in a way that isn't just seen as an aspiration because I think whenever these things are being presented to people now I think they want to see delivery they just don't want to say well this, this could be 10 or 15 years down the line. Um, well, uh, wh where we are in relation to the relationship between the programme for government and and the budget is that you know the programme for government as 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 published um, is to to contain the budget and um, you know that that is um, you know what the uh, the the legislation says. Um, where we are at the moment is that we are not in the position um, which as as set out in in NDNA. Uh, where we would have a multi-year program for government with multi-year budget and a multi-year legislative program, um, we are still a, 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 at a stage where we have single-year budgets. Um, so um, I think you know that is is clearly a constraint, I suppose, in terms of the longer-term planning and particularly in relation to infrastructure, which often needs to take a, a sort of a multi-year horizon and um, I don't know if any of my colleagues want to to say anything more in relation to that I think chair just in terms of the point that you know the program for government is a long-term plan and you know really the, the focus the next step um, is really around the action plan and you know it is likely that those actions will focus um, you know in the next year and probably the time frame of this the current year budget. Um, so I think we very much we are where we are, and um, but we will be planning accordingly. Yeah. And, and, and don't take that as a criticism either. I think it's probably just more of a more of an observation as to where we are. Um, the intervention with regards to the twenty mile per hour speed limit signs at one hundred schools is that the same? Are they the same one hundred schools that um, have been allocated within this current bu budget? Um, or is that an additional 100 schools? So it's just for, for clarity at the minute, these are just areas where at the minute, you know, we could contribute to the, to the um, draft outcomes. The actual action, that's the next stage in terms of this process. So um, the 100 schools referred to are the project that we're undertaking at the moment. Okay, so we, we, we could hope then that by the time that the programme for government has agreed that those 100 schools may have actually got their signs outside them. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be able to come back to you um, if you'll have us uh, to talk through the DFI actions uh, whenever that firms up more. Okay, no, I mean, I think obviously it will be the, the actions, I suppose, that will probably be more more meaningful, I suppose, once we get to sort of the more of the detail of all of this. Um, um, I appreciate what you're saying, so no, thank you. Um, Ms Anderson?
Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you all for for the presentation. Um, I find both the information you had you know, sent to us and then how you managed to do it there, I find that very useful. Um, I've looked at the What Matters Most research document uh, from, from NISRA, and that was part of the evidence gathering to inform the development of the program for government. Now, I, I thought that provided some very good feedback. However, the sample was small. There was only 51 uh, participants in total, and that meant that it was only a few people in each of the different age range uh, and from different backgrounds. So why was the sample so small? And as the program for government is a live document, um, is that something that can be amended through the duration? You know, like do you envisage having further engagements like this down the road? Uh, Chair, uh, if I could take this one. Um, yes, the, the, the piece of uh, research that you are referring to um, was some recent fo focus group work, uh, which was um, carried out uh, by TEO, uh, building on previous work, which had been done in 2016, uh, also on, on issues about what mattered most to people. Um, and uh, yes, it, it did include um, just 51 uh, participants, but it is a piece of qualitative research um, so, um, you know, very much the focus is on, um, you know, not just the numbers, but it is, it's really getting it into an understanding of why these things matter most to people and, you know, so a better understanding of what it is that they w w would like government to be able to, uh, to do to address those issues. But it is TEO-led research um, and perhaps, you know, sort of um, over and above the information which is actually contained in the report. I think any questions um, as to whether or not they are planning to continue uh, work along those lines, I think would be something that we would maybe need to direct to our colleagues in the EO programme for government team. Okay, well, look, um, if you could do that, then obviously some of us members, we are on different committees, so I'm also on the TEO committee, so I can, I can raise that there as well. Can I take you back to what you were saying about tackling those inequalities? Because obviously that needs to be a priority for the executive so we can invest in previously deprived areas and facilitate a, an equal, balanced and fair economy. Now, in the context of infrastructure, uh, this means proper investment in sewage. Uh, sewage infrastructure, I'm, I'm very acutely aware of my own constituency in Derry. For instance, if you don't have any drains, you're not going to have many cranes. So we need to ensure that we invest in sewage infrastructure and public transport as well as investing in roads and rail. So I noticed that this issue is referred to in the outcomes that you were talking about under the head and our economy is globally competitive, uh, regionally balanced and carbon neutral. So, so when I read that, I was a wee bit concerned because I noted that it isn't a key priority area in itself, which I thought it would be. And um, so I'd like to ask what assurances do we have that this outcome framework places the tackling of regional inequalities firmly within the executive's priorities? I can pick up that one, Chair. Um, I guess in terms of that, it's very helpful feedback, you know, and in terms of your thoughts on that. Um, our minister is very committed to addressing regional um, imbalances and all the points you made there, you know, we can reflect back. I don't know if Adele has anything further to add. Um, I, I haven't other, other than, you know, obviously these, um, you know, these are draft outcomes and also the key priorities and the strategies to which they are linked, you know, th those that is also draft and if the, the correct linkages haven't yet been made um, or if there are aspects, as you say, like regional imbalance, which perhaps you, you feel it maybe hasn't been given sufficient prominence in the in the outcomes framework, then those are issues which are still live and can be addressed. Okay. Can I ask you about something else that I don't think maybe has received prominence because I noticed in some of the key areas, including access to health and access to education. However, the DFA is not included within the depart de departments mentioned sort of within the priority areas uh, and that concerns me because I'm sure you'll agree that, you know, connectivity and having good public services, obviously from your point of view and others, uh, is placed 
um, in places, uh, and again, and not just my own constituency, but all over the north. But that's vital to provide equal access to these services. So has there been any consideration given to include DFI within such priority areas? And I say this after the ministerial statement on Monday, Tuesday, uh, where we were talking about collaborative spatial planning. Uh, for the BIC statement, because we obviously need to ensure it's not back-to-back -back development in constituencies like Derry and Donegal. We have going back to the previous conversation about sewage. You can't just resolve the issue about sewage up to the border and then leave a blockage because it obviously doesn't recognise uh, the petition border. So there are things like that there that we need to make sure that we're connected. And I was a wee bit concerned that the key priority areas didn't include the DFI in the way that I thought it should. Um, well, I think I mean all of the um, outcomes when they are the draft outcomes as they were being developed. There was consideration given to um, obviously to the key priority areas and to which departments you know um, contribution should be highlighted there. I mean, you, you could and and you do make the strong argument um, of how DFI does contribute in relation to health outcomes. Um, you know, it could potentially be be made more prominent, and and uh, and we as uh, and we take that feedback um, on that. Um, I think you know perhaps there there is um, an aim as well to concentrate on where on you know the linkages where the department makes the strongest contribution. Um, and you know, because you know, you could have probably um, you know infrastructure under every outcome and under very very many of the key priority areas. But I do accept that our contribution in relation to health, which I refer to sort of many times in in, in my remarks, um, if if your feeling is that that is not adequately represented in the draft framework, then I think that's perhaps something which should be um, a, a candidate for being revisited. Okay, just one final question, Chair. Just to understand the process uh, with the Programme for Government and uh, Section 75, because public authorities, as you know, already can to conduct an equality impact assessment um, when proposed legislation or policy uh, is likely to have a significant impact on equality of outcomes. And I suppose in the context of tackling regional inequalities, I'm just trying to understand where this consultation and the programme for government fits in to an EQIA. And an EQIA um, has been uh, published and is out for is, is out for consultation um, at the moment, um, and um, and you know they uh, I, I do appreciate that TEO colleagues have have also uh, made the point um, that um, you know whilst uh, it is a subject of consultation at the moment, it will in effect be a live issue and um, the uh, equality impacts and. and the addressing of disadvantage would be live going forward um, because the PFG will be live. There will be new actions which will be um, uh, can be added. Um, and the reporting against those actions is also um, that there is going to be, I believe, going to be more emphasis on being able to drill down into um, you know, sort of uh, rural and urban um, uh, statistics and statistics about Section 75 groups. Um, so I think there is uh, a commitment there um, from the executive um, that, um, that those those issues will be front and centre. Okay, well, I think it's something, Chair, for us maybe to keep an eye on because you have a consultation out in the programme for government and a consultation out of Section 75 consultation out as well on, on EQIA. So we just need to make sure that we capture all that and one informs the other and there's some kind of collaborative work going on as opposed to two running in parallel. But thank you, Chair, and thank you for letting me in. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. And it was just on that consultation process. I was wondering uh, just how you're working through that with the problems that we've been encountering in the last year, obviously, with COVID. Uh, are you satisfied that you're reaching out far enough and that the people are engaging? Chair, I'll take that with your content. Um, so in terms of the consultation process that is being led by the executive office. Um, and so I, my understanding is that they have had good engagement and certainly uh, 
speaking right back in terms of the details of who they have been engaging with. From our own point of view, um, our minister recently met with representatives from the business community to talk about the um, PFG and the uh, budget as well. And so Adele was able to talk them through the programme for government and we got some useful feedback there as well. Adele, I don't know if you have anything further to add on that. Um, no, I, th I think, um, I mean, certainly the reports that we are, are getting back from, from TEO is, uh, I mean, they, they have, uh, in a sense, put out an open invitation to stakeholders and potential consultees uh, to say that they will um, organise um, events with them. And they have had uh, quite a number of events um, already um, and, uh, and, you know, and further are planned. So, you know, within, you know, the, the constraints that, that we have of doing all our consultation online, um, it, there does seem to be very active engagement and, and certainly the reports back are that there's sort of very positive support for um, the, uh, you know, the fact that it, the Programme for Government Development has got to this stage and for the um, wellbeing based uh, approach being taken. And just, just moving to the end of the consultation then, and you're indicating that there could well be a uh, complete completeness by the before the summer. N knowing how, uh, maybe a bit sceptical, but I've been around a few years myself, <laughs> and I'm just wondering how ambitious that really is. It's, it just seems to be very ambitious, to be fair, considering the consultations that are out there at the moment. Um, I, I, it is. It is ambitious, and I, and I think um, you know, sort of, uh, the it, it, you know, a lot of a lot of work is being carried out in in parallel, um, to to uh, try and deliver against that that um, uh, intention uh, to have a a program for government published, um, the uh, you know, and agreed by the executive and the assembly before the summer. Um, the you know the, the fact that it will be a live PFG uh, in, a, in a sense is part of what will that could actually enable that to happen, um, because um, you can begin with having the agreed outcomes and the the key priority areas and the uh, and strategies and the initial actions um, can you know will will be populated but those are actions which can be added to so it, it's not the same as for example a program for government where you're having to to set out all of the actions that are perhaps you, you're intending to complete over a very long period of time um, so I, I think um, given the flexible nature and the flexible approach and, and web-based approach um, that uh, is planned and um, I think uh, potentially makes that a lot more achievable than perhaps that might otherwise be the case. Okay, we'll look forward to that. And finally, just there's a lot of maybe sort of talk around the city deals, and we're seeing some information emerging and so on and so forth. It's something that probably this committee with an infrastructure sort of aspect to it maybe need to have a look at themselves as to see how it's developing across the province. Uh, from a city deal infrastructure point of view, how do you, how do you see that uh, coming together in relation to obviously your end of budgets and your wish list and various things like that? I think it will impinge, the city deals will impinge on infrastructure fairly, fairly deeply. John, do you want to take that comment? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, you're right. Uh, infrastructure and regeneration is a key pillar of all the city deals. Um, and there are uh, th three deals at various stages of, of progression. The Belfast Region City Deal, uh, there are three infrastructure projects in that, Newry Southern Relief Road, Lag and Bridge, and BRT2. I think they're all mentioned in the slides. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, th these have been taken forward by councils and their city deal partners uh, and, and DFI will play a part but uh, it, it's it, the, the they don't really uh, until the deal is signed uh, we don't kick off to deliver those projects and at Belfast uh, you know the, the the city deal partners are currently uh, trying to prioritize the project uh, to enable the deal to be signed uh, Terry city and Straban uh, city terms was signed off last week and, and BFI has got uh, is, is leading on an infrastructure project in Derry as a part player in Straban regeneration. 
So we're obviously going to be part of that. And then uh, early consultations have kicked off with the Mid South West partners uh, uh, on uh, shaping ahead of terms for that. So look, essentially, city deals. Um, you know, there are various pillars: there's innovation, tourism, regeneration, infrastructure to create jobs, investment, and BFI is a key player. And you know, as being part of a player, as being a key player in this, it will deliver outcomes for for the regions. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, thanks very much for your presentations. And um, you're welcome back, Adele. It's, it's a while, I think. You. It is. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I just noticed that. I mean, the, we've reduced the the outcomes from a, what is it, twelve down to nine, yeah? Or is yes, it that's right. twelve? Now, for example, one of the previous ones was we have high quality public services. So I'm just mm -hmm. asking. When, when this policy is included in another outcome, what assurances do we have that no key policy objectives are diminished by any, any reduction in, in the, the outcomes and the remaining key priority? I'm sorry that, that you um, it was breaking up a little bit, your sorry, question. Yeah, one, one of the previous um, outcomes was we have high quality public services. So mm -hmm. I'm concerned what is identified in, in another outcome. Mm -hmm. I would be concerned, you know, that would lose some traction in this. That, and I mean, how do we ensure, as as part of PFG and the executive, that we deliver that outcome? You know, um, of delivering high quality public services. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I think as um, and I, I'm not I'm not privy um, to the, the thing within um, TEO as to why it is that that is no longer um, an outcome in itself. Um, it, it, it does. I mean, you can see that there is a, a sort of a, a, a very strong cross cutting element to that, and that it really is probably a feature of all of the of the outcomes. Um, but um, you no, know, I'm only, and Adele, I'm only using an example. You know what I mean? Sorry, yes. You know what I mean? That's what you know. Once we cut them down from twelve to nine, sorry, just in the office. Here. Um, we'll cut them down from twelve to nine, but that's the kind of thing we need. We need to be, and it, it's obviously a, I mentioned that as a different committee, but I'll bring one back to ourselves in the road safety strategy, which is a major one. About sitting within, we all enjoy long, happy, active lives. Mm -hmm. so, so my point is, I mean, we all know, and, and we as a committee, this was a key priority area for us. Mm -hmm. I would certainly be concerned that, you know, um, we should keep that as a key priority for us. Or, or if it's going to be incorporated, but it's incorporated in this outcome, it needs to be top of the list in terms of delivery for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, I'm sure the committee would be, because, I mean, you know, whilst it could sit within everyone feels safe, a different outcome, I, I think... Um, we would be calling, well, I would like to see it as a key priority for, for this committee, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I mean, irrespective of where something appears within the outcomes framework, um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't um, uh, reduce the, the, any perception of the extent to which it is a, a, a priority uh, for the department. And um, and I think maybe sort of just even maybe going back to your point about you know sort of how do we ensure that that you know things are um, that need to be priorities um, you know that the focus is kept on them. I mean a lot of that then is really is going down to what the sort of accountability arrangements are going to be around the program for government. Um, and uh, and I don't know if perhaps if Shan just wants to say maybe something just about about uh, what those uh, we hope that those will be within the department. Um, and, and how uh, we will ensure that, irrespective of where something is in the uh, appears in the programme for government, uh, that we will be, um, uh, you know, ensuring that we are delivering against it. Yeah. Thanks, Adele. So I think the, the one bit that we haven't talked about is how then the actions translate into our own departmental business plan. Um, and really, there's been very recent. Uh, I think NICS board endorsed uh, guidance and a template about how we build outcome-based accountability into our business planning process. So um, all of the actions that would be DFI-led within the, the PFG, would one would expect to feature in our 
in our business plan. And that will be monitored uh, as it is now on a quarterly basis through the departmental board and, and made available. So um, I think that just adds another layer. And also um, back to the point made earlier around the quality screening that all of those actions would, as per our DFI quality scheme, be screened at that stage as well. And um, so hopefully that builds some reassurance in terms of the monitoring of the DFI actions as a whole. And John, that, and that's the key point because whilst the, whilst the outcomes have reduced from 12 to 9 and incorporated and other things from a DFI point of view, from this committee's point of view, that all of those things that, that we have responsibility for, that the, the key outcomes are not lost, which they may be incorporated. Other elements and strategies are incorporated in those outcomes, but we deliver on them. And my point then goes on because we have a year of the mandate left, and, and you mentioned, uh, Adele mentioned single year budgets. We had a good debate yesterday in the chamber about, about multi year budgets. The, clearly, there's priorities are within the NA, and then obviously there's, there's the issue of short, medium, and long term goals right throughout, throughout the process. But my main point is we've only a year left in this mandate and what realistically we can deliver. We're, we're then, and each mandate obviously brings a new, you know, it brings a new government. And you, where, where are we in terms of, of this PFG, the piece of work we're doing now that, that's going to travel then further? Can you comment in relation to that, how we go forward, no matter what the makeup is? Yeah. And, and, uh, and a final point is, uh, I take it we've costed all of this, or we just, and I know the bidding process and everything else that goes with it and the allocations, but in terms of a cost and for, for our delivery of our outcomes. Okay, so on the first point, um, we discussed earlier the fact that the outcomes framework is a long term generational plan, really, and that does, we don't envisage that really changing much, although it is a live document, and if, I don't know, Something unforeseen COVID. No, 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 that's why I have to go. So that would provide that kind of overarching long term structure that we wouldn't really expect to change that much. Um, so hopefully that provides some reassurance on that point. On the bit about the cost things, it's, it's just reiterating a point made earlier. The actions themselves have not been agreed. That's the next stage. And so it would be those actions that then we would be costing. And one of the interesting things coming out of that, um, the, the, the business planning guidance that has been recently produced is that it is trying to link in the costs to individual actions. Now that's going to be really tricky. <laughs> so, um, and, and I don't know how, that's something that I'm starting to look at now around next year's business plan and how we do that. I don't know the answer. Um, I imagine it won't be, that easy in some cases and will be much easier than others um so it's not cost at the moment <laughs> <laughs> no no and i asked it in the context it, you know we're going to deliver a business model of some description be it doesn't matter if it's rural roads maintenance and mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm disappointed john didn't mention our man the infrastructure maybe it's in the mid southwest deal i don't know but but the point is that that we have a package in place that's going to deliver as well and that would be key element because you listen to the budgets, you listen to all the debates, and, and the point is, if we're ever serious of delivering the outcomes, it's, it's an infrastructure committee, obviously. So, so that's what it's about, and that's I asked in the context of, of costs and there. So, I'm, I'm sure the committee has no problem in supporting bids in relation to that. But, but listen, thank you very much for for your responses. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. I'm sorry, Roy, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Can, hello? You. Yes, hello. hello. Right, okay. Sorry about that. Um, just, uh, if I picked up your opening remarks correctly, you, you said that the depart departmental prioritization was for facilitating the all island economy. Um, is that correct? In terms, sorry, say again, sorry. I, I believe in some of the introductory remarks, uh, it was said that the uh, departmental priority was in facilitating the all island economy. Now, I have no difficulty in facilitating north south trade for mutual benefit, but surely we, we should be facilitating the local economy. 
Absolutely. Uh, I'm just trying to find my opening remarks where I made that, but certainly the point, I think it would be more reflecting that uh, we're very mindful of the need to work with um, counterparts in the South as well. But yes, the focus of the PFG is in um, regional imbalances and the local economy. Now, I have no difficulty in facilitating North South trade as long as it's not at expense of the local economy or East West trade. Uh, so I just want to make that point to start yeah. with. Then, then uh, looking at some of your slides, uh, and I'm um, sorry, they're, they're not numbers, it's uh, page 122 in ORPAC, heading our economy is globally competitive. Now, in that slide, um, you talked about progressing the NSSR as part of the city deal. Uh, sorry, I am aware of most um, acronyms, but I'm not aware of that one. And I'd be just warn you, or just ask you to be conscious that the public, when reading these documents, will not have a clue. I don't know what it is. What is it? It's an Erie Southern Relief Route. And, um, and uh, I think that in terms of these slides are for, this is not the public facing document as such. This is just in terms of briefing to yourselves, but we absolutely take that on board. Right, so the Yuri Southern Relief Road. Um, now, I, I, I'm just conscious uh, in terms of the prioritisation here. You mentioned the Yuri Southern Relief Road, the A5, the A6. Now, I thought that one of the most pressing uh, road schemes for the Northern Ireland economy, uh, and also to deal with um, health concerns because of emissions build up around the West Link, was York Gate. Why is York Gate not mentioned here? John, do you want to pick up that point? Oh, sorry. Why is Yorkie not yeah, mentioned? Sorry, <laughs> sorry I, I think for that slide, the, the, essentially taking forward the strategic roads program is, is a whole series. So that, that's essentially a paraphrase of the whole program. So on the, on the roads program at the minute, you have A5, A6, a1 Junctions, York Street, Newry Southern Relief Road, Balmahinch Bypass, Inneskill and Cookstown, Buchanan Road. So there's a whole series. Um, like Clearly the Minister has to set her priorities, but I think in terms of that slide, that's paraphrasing. Uh, in, in terms of priorities for the Northern Ireland economy, not for uh, uh, the whole island economy, in terms of the Northern Ireland economy, we should have York Gate listed there. So, so clearly, in terms of you know, the, there's a range of schemes, uh, and the minister uh, has to consider her priorities, you know, going forward. Uh, York Street, as you will be aware, uh, she she's carried out a review last year, and she's currently considering that review to deciding on the next steps for that scheme. I, I've made the point regarding that one. Uh, moving on to another issue there, another slide then with the heading, we live and work sustainably. Um, it talks about low emission hydrogen and electric, uh, and battery electric buses. Now, I'm pretty sure we can really tick the box on hydrogen. It's important that we just don't create lists that we can tick because we've already done them. So my, my question around that area is, uh, why are we not trying to facilitate uh, electric vehicles, or for that matter, ultra low emission vehicles, which can also bring about uh, health benefits for those living, particularly in urban areas. Um, Chair, may I take that question? Yeah, um, I suppose my point coming back to um, something that Shan said at the beginning, just to re reiterate, this is an indicative list. It is not the list. It is there. There is still to be work to be done on actions and to be done on consultation. So work, um, for example, at the moment, some of the work that's going on on um, ultra low emission vehicles would be part of the work that I'm taking forward as part of the um, energy strategy um, and looking at the decarbonisation of the whole sector. So I would expect as work progresses on the energy strategy, as the inputs that I'm making to DERA on decarbonisation start to feed through, that we would <coughs> see that as we um, start to develop an actions list, um, for consultation in the next few months that we would start to see those things um, be 
through. Again, just to emphasize, this was a list to give you an idea of the sorts of things. It is not a definitive list. And the consultation at the moment is on the, on the higher level on the outcomes. Okay, okay, thank you. But moving on to, to uh, another area, uh, you've talked uh, in some of your slides about wastewater management, yet everybody knows that there is an inadequate budget there and there were over 100 uh, regions of Northern Ireland where uh, planning permission cannot be granted for um, houses or indeed social houses or businesses because of inadequate uh, water infrastructure. So that is actually a major uh, blockage to uh, economic and uh, uh, economic development uh, and uh, actually in terms of investment as well because you'll not have any private investment coming in because they will not be getting their planning permissions. So I, 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 that's an area which I don't see adequately dealt with. Um, yet you have um, focused on you mentioned a number of times NDNA, which is unfunded. We we were not funded for NDNA. And if NDNA is held to be delivered, it will be uh, at the expense of basic essentials such as water treatment works. So my question is, why are we prioritizing the narrow water bridge, uh, the Ulster Canal, when we're not building sewage infrastructure? Uh, in terms of, I think, just reiterating those points, these are things, you know, in terms of the slides that um, are examples of the kind of actions that would fall under these outcomes. Um, I don't think that uh, there is any underestimation in terms of the importance of water and wastewater treatment um, within the, our work. But my point about NDNA being un unfunded, is that allowing individual ministers to push forward their hobby horses even though they're unaffordable? I think in terms of um, in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the focus of today, very much on, on the outcomes and the, and how then we utilise our budget position to deliver against these outcomes. And, and in terms of those outcomes, how are you measuring the um, the knock-on uh, investment, um, the benefit to the economy? of each of the projects in terms of prioritizing which projects, because as I've indicated, uh, uh, the inability to gain planning permission is preventing the investment of millions of pounds and the associated jobs in our economy. Yeah, and I think in terms of the outcomes provide a really useful way to be able to understand those knock-on implications on how the interplay between different work areas. Um, again, in terms of the outcomes, they will be assessed Progress against the outcomes will be determined by um, the indicators which are being worked on at the moment. In terms of the specific actions, they will need associated performance measures. But as I said previously, we're not at the stage of we haven't identified the actions yet. So once we have the actions, then that is when we would look at what performance measures we would use to determine how successfully or otherwise they are being implemented. And in terms of the relative prioritization of those, you know, that again will sorry, depend upon the budget. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you all for, for your update this morning. Just a couple of questions. I mean, I suppose leading on from, from Mr. Begg's point about an all Ireland an all island economy, you know, certainly um, from my perspective, on on a border constituency, um, it, it, an all island infrastructure um, is is key to to uh, the economy here in this local area. So I certainly think that it's it's really good to see that as part of the the introduction, and um, because I mean it, it it keeps us keeps that connectivity with the EU. But um, and that might not be the case in all in all areas, but certainly for my constituency, it's it's really really important. Just um, in terms of the program for government and, and how it's framed there, like the last uh, PFG, this framework uses an outcomes-based approach. And I'm just wondering, could you explain a wee bit more about the benefits of using this approach and helping the executive deliver its key priorities? Um, you know, is there any success stories or, or why, you know, just explaining why it is the preferred approach? Adele, do you want to pick up that point? <laughs> 
Um, I, th I think the, the the fact that it is the, um, the the preferred approach is, I mean, it do does go back, you know, sort of some time, but I think it it is um, around that that sense of um, a lot of the issues that we are facing are generational in nature, and it is um, having a, a, an assurance that the strategic. Um, uh, in effect, business plan for the executive has that long-term focus, and on you know societal um, and environmental, you know, and individual sort of well-being being at the core of it, and you know being able to translate um, and communicate to citizens and. Um, uh, having having asked them and listened to them what matters most to them and being able to build that into that uh, to that strategic plan and the opportunity to move away from the kinds of, of planning that we have had before which have um, focused on inputs outputs um, but without really looking at the impact that you actually achieve? Have you actually uh, made a difference? So I think that is, you know, a lot to do with with why, um, you know, this approach has uh, been um, adopted in the past, or has been supposed to be adopted in the past, and uh, and has been uh, sort of readopted as the as the approach going forward. There are also elements uh, in it, and the emphasis on collaboration, working within departments, breaking down departmental um, uh, boundaries, and also the recognition that government is not able to address these issues alone and that it needs to work in partnership with um, the country and community sector and with the uh, the private sector um, as well. Um, so I think it, 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 the OBA approach brings a great deal of, of richness uh, with it. Um, and just to finish as well um, uh, on, on something which I, I know um, is also a key element of it, along with collaboration, there's co-production and, and co-design. And it, it is uh, that sense of a, a continuous conversation with stakeholders and with the public about what matters and about um, involving them in how we design these solutions to these issues. Yeah, no, thank you, Diana. I think that's that's very helpful. I suppose it, there's no point in us doing things if it's just um, figures and statistics, but if we can see the, the true impact of that um, on on everyone in the community, I think that that's really, really good. Just you, you mentioned it about lessons learned from the 2016 programme for government. I was just wondering, could you touch a wee bit more on that and what specific lessons you think have been learned from that? Um, well, I think um, uh, one one of the lessons, I suppose, you know, in it was was um, you know, did we have, you know, whether maybe too many outcomes? Um, it is maybe in terms of you know just the language of the outcomes. It's about um, you know, do people actually you know fully understand you know the the wording you know that you had given and um, and I know that um, you know some of the um, perceptions work uh, which have been done by TEO um, sort of. Uh, you know, the feedback from that was that um, quite a number of people um, didn't really understand what we meant when we, we talked about connecting people and opportunities through our infrastructure. So there was some learning from that. And I think another lesson I think that has, has um, you know, been learned since 2016 is um, that the importance of the linkage between outcomes and actions. Actions are the things which the government with its partners are doing to uh, to try and progress achievement towards the outcomes. Um, we're not trying to pro progress, uh, progress achievement of the indicators. I think they became perhaps um, an over-focus um, on indicators and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of, well, if you could show that your indicator was improving, then that maybe, uh, you know, sort of there was over-reliance on that as a, a way of sort of demonstrating achievement towards the outcome. And indicators can only ever be indicators that you are moving in the right direction. So I think a number of those lessons um, have been taken into account.
Yeah, no, thank you. And and I suppose and in the other point in, in, in the paper around the immense potential to transform the way in which departments, including the FI, deliver public services um, by removing bar barriers and encouraging collaborative working. I mean, I this is something I've always really championed about the, the need for sort of cross-departmental working because we can we can solve quite a lot of problems if we work together instead of working in silos and, and you know, even in terms of being cost effective. Um, I know we had conversations in the past around community transport and, and things like that and how we could work in, in conjunction with the likes of the Department for Health and, and Education and all of that. And there's so there's so much potential there and I, I certainly agree. I think COVID has has definitely reiterated the importance of a joined up approach with departments. Um, local government and other stakeholders demonstrating the importance of working together to to deliver and, and to deliver well. And I think you've you've nailed it there, Dale, in, in in your previous answers around the impact. Because um, as you said, there, you know, if we're focusing on indicators and things, there's no real substance to that. I think it's about looking at how it's impacting on the people we're we're trying to deliver for. So it's just my, my final question. That's just to ask: How do you see this program for government aid and? in the, the improvement of collaboration and partnership working between departments and the public sector. Okay, Chair, if you can tell us, I'll take that one. Uh, I think, in terms of, and we talked about it at the beginning, just around the fact that the outcomes have been worded in such a way to really kind of, um, to blur the boundaries, I suppose, between departments and encourage mm -hmm. people to work together. Um, there's always room for improvement. I think you're right, COVID has really kind of encouraged us to work together and we see really interesting examples where you know for example you know the MOT centers have been used for testing you know we've seen um Liz Brooks you might want to say some more on this afterwards around um sort of pop-up cycle lanes and really embracing um, the opportunity there you know to encourage more people to walk and cycle if we look back in terms of DFI, we've seen some really good examples um, around the likes of the Conswater Greenway, where yeah. it got started off as a flood alleviation scheme and had huge benefits in terms of the, house, the houses not getting flooded and the impact that had on individuals, but also provided uh, a really excellent you know, the green, the Greenway and also space for nature and even tour, tourism offerings as part of that as well. So you can see sort of the multifaceted impact that those that working together can have. Um, I don't know if Liz wants to pick up just maybe on some of her partnership working that's been taking place. Yeah, um, thanks, Shan, and thanks, Chair. What I suppose for me, one of the big learning points from COVID has been um, how much you can achieve through partnership working, but also how time consuming it can be. I've done um, a lot of work. We started off with some of those pop up ideas around cycle lanes and footpaths um, that kind of expanded into a piece of um, work that we were doing then with DFC and with DERA and with all of the councils around co the COVID revitalization program and looking at small interventions that make um, our towns, cities and villages more livable and just nicer places to be um, so that as people start to emerge from lockdown there is something for them to come back to um, also, um, a lot of work I mentioned before, the energy strategy, that's been really great in bringing together lots of the transport stakeholders and talking about, okay, if we're going to decarbonise, what does the future look like? And the interplay there between the statutory agencies, but also the private sector is starting to bring some really interesting ideas forward. And we've commissioned um, research around some of those just to see how we can um, take that into the energy strategy and how we work together on that for the future. And the other obvious one um, where I've been doing a lot of collaborative work is around climate change, um, mm -hmm. both with the third sector, but also with DERA. And obviously, again, transport, second biggest contributor to greenhouse gases. So working with the transport sector to think about how we move things forward so it's it has been both exhilarating and exhausting but it's definitely the way forward because we get much better solutions out of it yeah and just to, to, to kind of conclude but go back to the point Sean made around the um the Concord of Greenway in in um Newry where we have uh we are working towards the the building up of the new city park um at the Albert Basin site mm -hmm. um and I mean 
one of the things that I has as as the last year in particular has rolled on. You know, initially we kind of I, I don't know if we do it unintentionally, but we set our sights quite low and we think we'll get a park, we'll get a green space in the play park and that's yeah. kind of the vision. But over the last year for me anyway, um I see that there's so much potential and so much benefit and that kind of collaborative working would be key to the likes of a city park for Murray. Um, you know, in terms of even economic recovery as a tourism uh, focus point yeah. for Newry, I think it could be the corner stone of, of economic recovery. Um, and I'm very, I'm being very selfish in talking about that, but I think when you look across the north, and, and the Conswater Greenway is an excellent example. When I sat in Newry Morning Down Council, we had a presentation from them, mm-hmm. and I think that was where we need to go. But that, that site in particular, um, where, where we're hoping to, to build the city park, links in with the, the Carlingford um, Greenway, um, and I mean, we're we're obviously in a, in a, a really um, good location in terms of of the island uh, in a border constituency, and I think it's something that will help to bring people, as you said, who want to come and live in Uri, who want to come and work in Uri, and, and 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 raise their families and all of that. So, when people have ideas, I think you have to start thinking outside the box and see how that because that brings people to the town, that brings people to our shop, to our restaurants, and all of that. So. I'm really excited to see the, the level of collaborative, uh, you know, the focus on collaborative working and working across departments. And I think, as again, a most selfish way, I can see how that will certainly benefit us in terms of progressing this major project for, for Newry. So thank you all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the officials for um, attending uh, this morning and for the information that's been provided. It's been very useful. and. Number of the questions that I was going to raise have already been asked. Just one in relation to the objectives that are set out within this, the, the budget will be the key determinant in terms of being able to achieve what's been detailed. When about will that decision be made by the department in terms of the allocation of the budget for the next financial year? And is there any desire to rebalance that budget towards active and sustainable uh, travel? Thus far, Northern Ireland has been historically an underinvestment in in that, and uh, I feel that we need to be looking at how can we rebalance our budget to ensure that we achieve the need to move towards more active and sustainable travel. Shall I maybe take that, Chair? Um, just in terms of the uh, budget, um, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not over all the detail of the budgetary process, but my understanding is that um, the minister will make decisions over the next few months on that. You would expect me to say that I would be very keen to see um, a bit more um, money going towards the active travel side. Um, And certainly the minister had already made a really good start this year with the 20 million pounds of capital for blue green infrastructure. after Easter, she intends to publish the Belfast Cycling Network. So I think that will again be an opportunity to invest more in um, walking and cycling. Also, um, I have to say though that um, it, it is going to, I mean, all the signals are it's going to be a very, very difficult budget. Um, so I think we just have to wait and see for now. Yeah, it's just I'm aware in the Republic of Ireland they're driving mm-hmm. towards a two to one ratio in terms of expenditure towards new public transport infrastructure and also new roads. So, you know, if we were to achieve the ambition that's set out uh, by the Minister and within this, we do need to have step change in terms of how we in, we invest. And I know it's a flat resource budget, mm-hmm. but there is an increase in capital. Mm-hmm. Um, there is an opportunity to to do things around that and and. You know, what, one of the concerns is around the Greenway infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Is that whilst that money being set aside is to be welcomed, um, there's no resource funding currently in this financial year towards that. And I just want to be if there's any consideration given towards that because we need to incentivize uh, bodies such as councils and others to bring forward those schemes. Because if we don't, I fear that we're going to have another year of slow progress in that. Um, it's kind of slightly off topic, but I have actually um, been looking at ways to capitalise some of the, what would traditionally be resource expenditure, which would hopefully help that process. Yeah, I think that would be important um, because, you know, within the document, it's like the, it's talking about um, greenway development and, you know, the blue-green infrastructure fund 
So there is a capital and resource requirement to do this. And one way is to, to achieve green ways, you also need to bring people with you. So you need to be able to do engagement through, for example, the SUS Trans One Path Initiative to ensure that people share the path. Uh, because a lot of the green ways that are already in place were much easier to implement, but you're now moving into more difficult areas in terms of land acquisition and stuff like that. It's important to have that. Um, one other question is just in the very beginning, it refers to um, delivery of the roads improvement program. Is there a detail in relation to what that program is and how that's prioritized? Yeah, I'm maybe take that one. So, um, and maybe Liz, you want to come in as well. So, um, uh, looking forward, the department's developing a new regional strategic which will look at uh, road, bus, and rail, and set the priorities going. But where we stand at the minute, and, and, and I listed about 10 schemes there that are on the current development program at various stages, and, and they they have come from previous transport plans. So um, uh, uh, the, the minister last year asked us to continue to develop those, uh, and, and that's what we're doing. And, and ultimately, and I think the point's been made quite a lot, that the future plan, the track water, wastewater, uh, bus rail schemes all depend on, on, on forward budgeting and the, the amount of money available to the minister uh, to, to allow her to, to deliver these against her priorities. Liz, maybe do you want to say something about the transport plan? Yeah, just to confirm what John's saying there, I mean, we are working on the regional strategic, well, we're working on the whole um, suite of transport plans. The first one that will come forward um, for the minister is the regional strategic network plan. Um, and that will set out the regional priorities, both in terms of um, roads, but also public transport um, and um, active travel, um, although as on the regional network, there will be less input on active travel, and it will be more about focus will be more on public transport. Um, but yeah, that's the process that I'm working through at the moment. Yeah, it's just I think it's important to get details of what that that program is, and also one of the other issues is that with that increase, and particularly for John here, uh, with that increase in capital funding for uh, the. It's about the capacity of the department then to be able to to deliver the projects and to spend that. Um, and obviously the budget's going to be coming up here at half twelve. Um, and you know, there's potential for further Barnet consequentials arising from that. And it's just what well, your confidence levels are, John, in terms of the ability to deliver uh, upon that capital envelope that's been awarded. So so in terms of the strategic road improvements, mm -hmm. I, I have confidence they can be delivered. Actually, the, the constraining factor will be the budget going forward. So, uh, you, you know, when, when you list the strategic road schemes, I think it comes to two billion. Mm. Uh, and then, if you if you add all the other sort of capital requirements that the minister is faced with for transport, active travel, water, wastewater, you, you can see that uh, you know there's a there's a budget, and then she has to set, and that that, that leads to difficult choices for mm. for, for the minister. In terms of um, you know development, we're we're continuing to develop those uh, and get them to a position where where ministers can make choices. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the officials. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, the officials, for for coming along today. I have just sort of one question, and I was picking up on Roy, and I think Andrew picked up on it, and it maybe for you, John, on the economy uh, is a globally competitive, regionally balanced, and carbon neutral outcome. Is that list, or we'll call it a list, what way do you categorise that list, and is it regionally balanced? And I think Roy has picked up on that, to be fair. I don't look at it as being regionally balanced across Northern Ireland. We're looking at the North West, the extreme West, the South East, and the City. And it's not all about Mid Ulster, but it's not a regionally balanced list. Is those bullet points in order of preference, or what way is that list compiled? Call it a list, what way is that compiled? So, uh, I think the 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 the, 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 the the SRI development program, strategic road improvement development program, stems from the original transport plan that was published in 2005 or six, um, and, and then within that, uh, you, you ministers set various priorities for which which schemes can be taken forward. 
Um, so, you know, I think it, our minister has made it very clear that she's committed to both improving connectivity and dealing with regional imbalance. So, in, 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 in looking at those schemes, there's, there's a range of schemes right across the province. Um, but I say going forward, uh, you know, whatever transport schemes are taken forward will be determined by the priority set in the new regional strategic network transport plan that, on which there will be a consultation for, for people to give their views on, on issues like the just Yeah, but the, the list I'm looking at, John, is obviously not regional. You may argue different, but it's not. There's absolutely nothing in the centre of Northern Ireland at all. It's the northwest, southeast, the city, and away to the extreme west. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I suppose, labour the point. Uh, we need to keep it more reflective and more regional, considering the areas with the higher number of engineering and manufacturing output. It's simple. It's on yeah, the map. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so I think that when we look at a strategic plan, that, that, that will take that into account. Okay. Or should we take it into account? Thank you, and I appreciate that you've come along, and a lot of other questions have been covered, so I'm happy enough for that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair, and I know much has been uh, already said, so I'll try to be brief, but I suppose we should remember and acknowledge uh, uh, the staff who have worked hard throughout COVID, and obviously, as uh, the Assembly and Executive were restored way back last year, I'm just reminded today is the day of the election count, I think, in 2017. So uh, we've, uh, we've only really had one year, unfortunately, in the Assembly and the Executive. And then whenever the Minister came into post, faced with the immediate crisis of the MOT lift. Uh, so it has, uh, I think, to say it's been a difficult year would probably be an understatement. And it uh, looks like the year ahead is not much better in terms of both the challenges of COVID and the challenges of an extremely uh, tight budget. Uh, I acknowledge uh, uh, some additional funding uh, for capital, but it's fairly inexplicable uh, where um, many people regard uh, infrastructure as being a key driver of the economy, that it has received the lowest budgetary increase across all departments. I think that's very disappointing. And it's even further disappointing to look at uh, the resource budget, particularly when one does look at the state of our roads, particularly in rural areas. So, uh, I mean, with those caveats, I suppose it is encouraging that the programme for government does uh, commit to uh, playing a role in, in the ongoing challenge uh, of the climate crises, and in particular, uh, some of the spends in active travel and the green and blue pathways. Can I just ask, in, in relation to uh, councils, which are also facing very tough decisions as they're setting their rates this year, um, in terms of... Um, the, and I suppose the loss of EU funding is, a, is another downside. But really, um, uh, has there been much a discussion with um, Solis or Nilga? You know, in terms of maybe joint, you know, the uh, trying to get a sense from them, uh, councils and how committed they are. I suppose maybe some parties might uh, give some better response to. But it just is a, a thought that I've had. You know, uh, in terms of officials, you know, having. A, a degree of influence across the councils uh, in terms of an assessment of council's commitment to that agenda, you know, and, and setting some budget aside because it has to be a match funding project in, in many ways. And the other um, thing that uh, I, uh, and I heard Keith say, you know, that Oscar's in the central universe, but Upper Ban is pretty much, you know, but I think Portadown was one time the hub, you know. So uh, there are some feasibility studies ongoing, which I'm, I'm pleased in terms of real infrastructure. Uh, I just wonder um, when might we expect to see the findings of those feasibility studies and how and what role, if any, can they play, play into in terms of the programme for government for this year? Or is it more to expect that to be uh, a more medium to long term project. Thank you. Um, on the real feasibility study, I'm not aware of the timescales, but I can get back to you unless Liz knows. I, yeah, I, I can maybe sorry, just pick that up quickly. Yeah. 
um, we hope to take the um, feasibility study forward with the with ABC Council over the next weeks and months. I, what I would expect the outcome of that to do is to feed into the um, regional transport plan that we've been talking about. So it will provide data and information for that plan and the public the. Um, aspiration for that plan is that we would be out to consult later in the year. Okay. Thank uh, you. Just add, can yeah. I, sorry, can I just maybe add, in relation to the Mid-South-West, uh, so officials at council level and officials in DFI have had some good engagement over the last uh, number of months to help the, uh, the councils develop that deal. Yeah, John. Sorry, Mrs. Kelly, you're on no. mute. Sorry, Chair, this thing's not sent. I'm going to nearly hover over the call. It seems to change, but I, I just um, was about to go a long way off the city. Game. Congratulations to Derry and Belfast, you know, on, on driving that forward. Um, they, John will know uh, uh, that uh, in the Upper Land constituency and, and indeed in the in, um, Part of Tyrone, the, the importance of the agri food sector, you know, and, and particularly in the ABC area of the manufacturing base. And there's some uh, fairly critical um, employers, uh, both in, in life sciences, the pharmaceutical industries as well. And I just wonder around the engagement, you know, in terms of their long term business plans and what impact that would may have, I think, on strategic road networks or in relation to their ads around uh, being able to. Um, shift goods and people uh, that, that has been a problem as you would know um in, in, in my area in terms of um, numbers of employees all coming out at the same time onto a very poor road network if that makes sense john it's just you know to say that i think you know the strategic roads i i, I like to think of the consultation uh, being very widespread and very um innovative and um, and, and it's overall thinking, you know. Yeah, I, I think I think I probably know where you're coming from there. There's probably two issues. So you know, if you go up, take this to the highest level. You know, the regional development strategy is all about you know, spa you know, how the region develops spatially, and, and and then that links to the transport plans that we talked about. And and if you like, you know, strategic roads are our main arteries of the of the economy. Therefore, it's important to get them right. And, and that's what the plan will be looking at going forward. Uh, 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 you know, to, to look at where there are strategic locations to access the goods and services. So, I think going forward, we'll have a look at that. I think maybe specifically, you might be alluding to sort of local traffic issues at, at certain locations in your area. And, and I think that's probably one. You know, at a local level within the division, I think they have been trying to engage you know with businesses and with local political representatives to see whether there are solutions. And just, Chair, could I say that, you know, it is critical that we have good north-south linkages, and I want to support the, those colleagues who have uh, spoken already in support of that, uh, because uh, increasingly uh, we're going to see challenges as an outcome of Brexit in terms of accessibility across the island and across east-west as well. So um, I, I understand the uh, programme for government um, is somewhat restricted in terms of the resource and capital available to it, and that's a matter of regret. Okay, thank you. Uh, that seems to conclude questions from members. Um, Liz, Shan, John, Adele, can I thank you very much for your time this morning and, mm -hmm. and answering so comprehensively, and we'll look forward to seeing you again whenever this process has been concluded, and there'll be more detail um, to those plans. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members, if you're content, we'll move then through to our next item of business. I'm conscious of time. Um, so we're going to have a briefing now from the Construction Employers Federation. So I'll refer you to page 130, where we have um, a briefing paper. Um, Hansard will again record this session. And if I can welcome witnesses who are again attending by Starleaf, Mr. David Fry, the Director of External Affairs at Construction Employers Federation, and Mr. Mark Spence, who is the Managing Director of the same organisation. 
You're both very welcome to this morning's meeting. We're moving into the afternoon now. Um, apologies um, for the delay. Um, but if I can ask you to um, make an opening statement and we'll follow up with them with some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to give evidence to the committee today on the, the draft 21-22 executive budget. Uh, my name is Mark Spence. I'm the Managing Director of Construction Employers Federation. I'm joined, as you say, by my colleague today, David Fry, who's Director of External Affairs. Uh, just by way of background, the CEF is a certified representative body for the construction industry, which employs directly around 30,000 people in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have over 800 member companies ranging from micro-businesses employing just a handful of people to some of the largest construction companies in Northern Ireland. And in total, our members would account for around 70% of construction spend in Northern Ireland. Uh, members of the committee have our briefing paper on the, the subject matter, so I will only raise a few points in this discussion and David will follow on. Um, with a few headlines from our own member survey uh, taken in January this year, uh, covering the six month period at the end of last year. Uh, 2020 was a very difficult year for construction, obviously, and two thirds of all turnover last year was conducted in the, the latter half of 2020. Uh, as a result, the overall annual turnover for most of our members last year was down by around 25% on previous year. The number of companies reporting a reduction in their profit margin is 11 times higher than those reporting an increase. Uh, members see this as a very difficult market uh, in 2021 and a very challenging context, therefore, for this draft budget. Having said that, the conventional capital budget of $1.75 billion does represent a substantial uplift from 2021 and is welcomed. Uh, it's worth noting, however, that this is the first time since 2007-2008 that the Northern Ireland Executive's capital budget has reached these levels. And in that context, if you consider construction inflation alone, there's going to be consider considerably less delivery uh, within the same budget. We have a very challenging commercial sector this year uh, and likely next. Uh, that will therefore create undoubtedly more competition for public works, which do continue. And while this in many ways is a good thing, uh, it has to be acknowledged that this is occurring at a time uh, when a significant number of public works are being procured on a price only basis. Uh, that does create a, acute pressures on pricing and a, a downward spiral uh, on the, the, the pricing of tenders. This combines with some other aspects which we will cover uh, in our discussion, uh, and particularly the impact early in the year on material supply and pricing. Uh, there were some well-publicised issues on matters like steel imports at the start of the year, and as many of these are beginning to resolve themselves on the supply side, uh, typically behaviour on pricing takes longer to settle down at the stage it is still very hard to gauge. That alone puts massive pressure on contractors who now have to price appropriately for both one-off projects and more difficult, actually, as long-term arrangements, and, and many of these are under the, the, the remit of DFI, such as measured term contracts. Very difficult to set prices now for a sustained period of operation. In the wake of the uh, UK-EU membership referendum in 2016, a number of government clients faced months of pressure getting projects awarded on the ground due to the understandable inability of contractors to stand over pricing at that stage, which had been submitted pre-referendum. We're very real concern now today is that the similar situation is coming to pass, that there are many pressures on pricing and without flexibility on the part of clients that could lead to challenges with respect to getting contracts awarded in a timely manner and in a manner that aligns with the detailed draft budget plans once they become available. I'm going to pass over to David now, who's going to address some of the detailed aspects in the budget. Um, thanks, Mark. So, so just on the detail, um, so with the exception of the high level spending allocations to each department uh, and some sporadic detail on specific projects, I think it's fair to say there's little information at present on how the capital budgets will be spent by each department. Um, and we fully appreciate that the, the draft was only published on the 18th of January, but there have been some government plans that have suggested to us that even indicative figures won't be published until April or May. Um, that's a concern that we've shared in a meeting with the Department of Finance on the 2nd of February. Um, in our view, the process needs to be expedited uh, because without it, we risk for yet another financial year real challenges in getting our capital budget spent in the most productive way. Um, additionally, for our members, it creates uncertainty uh, over the next couple of months with respect to what projects they price uh, as they come to tender. Uh, it is, of course, though, worth noting that 
a significant element of the 2021-22 capital spend is already contractually or otherwise committed. I think our understanding is that in DFI alone, going into the new financial year, about 560 million of the 670 million is already in that position. So the discretionary spend is, a, is, a, is actually a relatively small amount of the overall budget. Um, Moving through a bit more detail, um, I think it's welcome from our point of view to see the RRI borrowing facility being used, um, particularly as its funding has to be in large part uh, put towards the construction sector. It's also significant that it's been put in at this stage towards two areas which are in pretty drastic need, uh, Northern Ireland Water and New Build Social Housing. Um, on the matter of Northern Ireland Water, um, you know, our members are already part of a suite of contractors that will deliver a large element of the PC21 programme. Um, but as the committee is well aware, given the scale of the works that are required in PC21, I think it's pretty important that there is early understanding of how much of next year's budget will go to Northern Ireland Water. Um, 70 million of our RRI borrowing is a, is a pretty good start, but you know, by our estimate, in order to meet PC21 over its six-year period, that figure would need to be trebled, if not likely quadrupled, in terms of its construction spend to ensure PC21 is delivered. Um, I think we retain the view that even with these allocations, that Northern Ireland Water's governance and funding challenges must be urgently reassessed. Um, we would be concerned that if there was a surge in Northern Ireland Water spend next year, uh, that it would be somewhat um, difficult if that was then followed by a downturn in the following year. Um, one other area, Chair, that we would like to focus on is around the executive's flagships. Again, the allocations that we understand that are being made will ensure that a large element of what is currently on the ground will be completed in the coming financial year, particularly the A6 works. We, as an industry, we've always held some level of concern with regard to the flagships and how the conditions are for naming a project a flagship. The ring fencing that goes with them has a work where projects are actually at or close to their construction stage. Um, so while projects like Phase 1 of the A5 and the redevelopment of casement are important and must be speedily delivered, we have seen monies returned against each in the most recent January monitoring round because neither has entered construction in this financial year. So looking to the next executive mandate, I think if we are going to take certain key projects and name them flagships, we do need to think about the definition of those. Um, looking to the future, we fully concur with what the Finance Minister has said with respect to getting additional fiscal flexibility with respect to our capital budget, specifically end year carryover. Um, we acknowledged the executive wasn't able, as had been the plan, to set a multi-year budget due to the one-year CSR. Uh, I think we would still anticipate a, a CSR by the Treasury later on this year, and it would be certainly good to know what the executive's intentions are if such a document was published. I mean, would they go into the election in the spring of next year having set a multi-year budget, or would they only set a one-year budget? Um, that's something which, frankly, we, we, we don't know and would, we would know if we'd be interested to find out. Um, and just before we conclude, you know, we would, as an organisation, support the establishment of an independent fiscal council and also an independent infrastructure commission. Um, and also, Chair, again, final point before conclusion, um, we are more than happy if any members today want to bring up uh, the review of the planning act or, or anything within that. Um, obviously, we welcome it being live. I think we would also share some concerns at the at the four-week period, given that this is an act which is 10 years old in of itself, um, and there are a number of issues with the planning system, which we, on behalf of the contracting industry and the house building industry, would certainly want to address. So on that, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for both of you for your presentation. Um, obviously, COVID has had a, a, an impact on, on your industry, and you did say that it was a game of two halves with regards to um, your turnover for um, uh, 2020. Um, can I just ask uh, what the implication has been for some of your members who may um, be involved in, in tender projects in the Irish Republic and the consequences on their businesses with the current restrictions? 
Yes, as you're aware, Chair, in the Irish Republic, uh, construction remains largely closed, not entirely closed. Uh, key strategic projects continue and essential maintenance continues, but uh, the Irish Republic is, is unique in, in the European context where construction is closed and remains open here. So that, that does present difficulties for our members who do work cross borders. We have a lot of members who work cross border and, and they're disappointed as our counterparts, the, the CNEF are disappointed that construction hasn't been enabled to be fully reopened uh, in the Republic. Um, but I know they're working hard with the Irish government to, to secure that reopening at the earliest opportunity. But it, it is a, a difficulty and a frustration. Okay, and is that because of the impact that that has had on, on those businesses? Because obviously that, that's going to make a, a difference to if they've sort of contracted for a period of time, there's now a, a considerable delay. Um, and they may have missed that opportunities in, in Northern Ireland then as a, as, a, as a consequence of taking those up? Yes, I mean, these are, these are all part of the, the difficulties of operating in construction and, and the nature of construction tends to be fairly, fairly medium and long term decisions around which contracts to tender for uh, and, and contractors will decide uh, on the basis of what they're committed to currently, what they have capacity to tender for other projects. So any, any project they're involved in, wherever that be, uh, if it is stalled for any reason, probably does impact their capacity to tender for additional work at the time when they very much need it. Okay. Uh, and just in relation to um, the issue of um, flagship um, projects, and I mean, you've cautioned um, in relation to that in your paper, uh, and you've also referenced it in your presentation. You know, how would you define those types of projects? Um, how would you how would you like to see them categorised? I, I think the, the, the term flagship and, and, and you know the, the reference to it. I mean, these are key strategic projects that need delivered. I mean, our our members don't question that, and in many cases, our members are very keen to deliver these projects. The issue has been more about how you know if 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 you have a project which, for whatever reason, be it a planning issue or be it something to do with a procurement issue, be it for those reasons that it is held up in a you know and you've allocated a certain amount of money, it's held up. But because it, it has this specific ring fence around it, that the money has to be returned to the centre and the department can't use it internally, that that has caused challenges over the last few years. The other piece, going back to when the, the flagships were first talked about in December 2015, I think was when they were first put in the executive's budget for the 15-16 financial year, uh, sorry, 16-17 financial year, was what you were seeing was an awful lot of, say, DFI's money going to flagship projects. Um, that that means that there's very little left for anything else. Um, and, and that certainly causes issues where you have a very wide array of, of projects that, that, that need to be delivered and a wide array of internal clients, be it TransLink, be it Northern Ireland Water, be it the Rivers Agency, who, who need to have separate fund, who have separate funding needs but their projects aren't called flagships. So it, it's, it's about how you manage your expenditure um, and how you prioritize it. But you know the concept of having key projects to deliver over a mandate, uh, I mean, yes, you know, we, we'd be very happy to see that. And uh, it gives a focus, which also then for our members, they can, they can to some extent understand what is likely to come to the market over say a three or four year period. Well, I recognise you're here to talk about the budget you have referenced, um, the, the review of planning, and it might be useful just at this opportunity, you know, given the opportunity that you have to be here at the committee, maybe just to, to highlight some of the concerns that you have with regard to the current process so that we can then feed that in and obviously uh, at a later date whenever officials come back to us. Y yes, Chair, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're now, as I said, 10 years on since the Act. Uh, six, well, more or less six years on since the transfer of powers. So what we have now is a pretty good picture of how pre-application community consultation has been working, how pre-application discussions have been working. Um, I think probably if, if we were to pick point one thing, which is the most concern is, is the response time frames from statutory consultees. Uh, I mean, our view would be that these haven't really got any better. They, they probably have to some extent got worse. We understand as I think was discussed in your previous evidence session, there are some historical issues there around the voluntary exit scheme, which I think a number of different statutory consultees have experienced. 
Um, but it, it, it makes uh, you know, the existing time frame for responses, really, we don't recognize it as happening in, in the real world. I think as, as an industry, we would be quite prepared to see some kind of matrix system put in place, some kind of processing agreements whereby it may be quite understandably the case that if you have a very complex application, it's not realistic for a statutory consultee to come back with a substantive response in three or four weeks. But if it was six weeks uh, or eight weeks and they were tied to that, then that would at least give some level of certainty. Um, so, so those are the kind of things that we would, would certainly draw out in our in, in the response that we would make. Um, there are a few other areas that I think our members have noted over the last few years. So, for instance, where you do get a, a planning permission, where you get the green slip, there are, I think it's a case now across most councils, you'll find that the list of planning conditions that comes with the permission, it just seems to get longer and longer. Some of the conditions, like you know, being able to connect into a wastewater treatment system, uh, are totally understandable. Other conditions, you know, we would take the view that they can be discharged as a site, say a new housing site is being developed. Uh, but where a lot of these planning conditions currently sit is that they all have to be discharged before, say, if it's a housing site, you do any groundwork. Um, that for us seems a little bit over the top um, uh, and it's something that we would be quite keen for the review to look at. Um, I, I think we and other organisations in the business community that we have spoken to, we are a bit concerned that the planning review is being you know, seen as a relatively small scale exercise. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it shouldn't really be a, a review of our planning system in, 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 all, in, in, in name, in, in totality, because as I say, you know, we are 10 years on from the Act and an awful lot has changed since that Act was passed. Okay, thank you very much. Miss um, Anderson? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you both, uh, Mark and David, for, for your presentation and the information we received. Um, we make reference to the effect of Brexit and um, that it's going to have on, say, for instance, the practical for materials such as steel and how that will impact on the industry in terms of making it difficult to cost projects. So you said that this can be challenges with respect to, to getting contracts awarded in a timely manner. So this is obviously concerning, um, as we are all aware of the um, what we need to do to try to kickstart the economy coming out of COVID. And you mentioned some of those things here today. So can you elaborate on this and touch on the wider impact of what I would call a disaster of Brexit and what that is doing to your industry? So if I, if I follow, where we are at the moment is, I suppose, a very un unstable economic situation and, and that arises from obviously the pandemic which has had disastrous consequences and we have had certainly uh, issues uh, arising from Brexit uh, and, and the logistics really are behind that and what drives that. What we would find now uh, over two months in is that the logistical issues are beginning to resolve themselves. We're not hearing the same issues arising from members, the same quantum of issues, but the pricing issues remain. There's pricing certainty as a result of the current situation, and there will be actual price increases because members are now uh, realigning their supply chains, very often through the Republic and directly from Europe, to bypass TB where they're finding logistical issues. So they're, they're having to forge new relationships, new partnerships with, with sellers of product who they maybe don't know, so they, they're not being able to maybe take advantage of the same pricing. So there's general price increases. Uh, there have also been increases in, in material costs. And again, some of it is logistical. Uh, and there are issues which are, are neither Brexit nor COVID, which are logistical in terms of international uh, shipping freight. Uh, so again, it's very hard to take a, even a medium term view on pricing. We believe some of this may settle down. But the difficulty, as you appreciate, is you, you are sitting as the public sector with finite resources and budgets, and you're trying to tie a contractor into a definitive price, which can't be varied after award of contract. And that creates huge risks for the contractor, but actually creates risks for the awarding authority as well, should the contractor get into difficulty trying to deliver for that price that they have tendered. So it is a difficult period. Um, David, you, you may wish to add some, some historical perspective on that from, from previous times. 
Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some senses, it is quite similar, uh, in, in, in theory at least, to what happened after the referendum in 2016, because what happened there was obviously the, with the value of sterling fell significantly, frankly, overnight, and we saw material prices feeding through instantly, really. And what we have said to central procurement director and other government clients when we engaged with them over the last few months is just to be mindful of that, because on most construction projects, new build schools, things like that, what will happen is you will have, when you when you come to doing your tender price for that, you will have pre-tender estimates within that documentation. Those pre-tender estimates by the clients could have been done some time ago, maybe, maybe not that long ago, but certainly a number of months ago. And what happened in 2016 was a number of projects, particularly in the edu Department of Education, where the pretender estimates may have been done in March, April 2016. They were then priced in early June 2016. But by the time you get into July 2016, effectively contractors couldn't stand over the prices anymore because the business case tolerance that was built in was 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 busted. Um, and, and that's something which we're just saying to the clients to be mindful of because once those prices went up, the material supplies they didn't they didn't come back. They, they found a, a ceiling, but they didn't come back down again. And, and that's the thing which we just need to be mindful of as contractors are pricing projects which may be developed over a couple of years, or things like measured term contracts where you're almost providing a schedule of rates right now, and knowing where those rates are going to be in two or three years' time. Um, mm -hmm. Is, is now on impossible, frankly, yeah. um, in the current climate. Okay, it's a cost of Brexit uh, for everyone, including yourselves. Could I could I go back to what you were saying in relation to the housing development being very dependent on wastewater capacity? Uh, investment, indeed, it is an issue, I know, uh, across the north, but it's certainly um, an issue that, that I'm raising here in my own constituency of Derry. And, and for adapting the phrase, you know, no drains, no cranes. So what would it mean for the construction industry if our wastewater capacity issue um, of all those issues were not tackled? And can you maybe elaborate a little bit of what you said, of potential opportunities in RRI uh, to deal with it, not on a year-on-year -year basis, but across the, the life period of PC21? I mean, you know, PC21, uh, the draft determination that has been provided by the regulator has 1.7 billion over, over six years. I mean, if we look at this current year, Northern Ireland Water's capital budget was 140 million. So even if you average out 1.7 billion over six years, you're doubling this year's figure. Um, uh, that is a huge step change because DFI obviously have to allocate you know, the A6 schemes, the A5, the transport hub, uh, translinks, budget, road maintenance. So I think we would have concerns that meeting PC21 through just the block grant alone is, is going to be a challenge. I, now, where we do have something in place is Northern Ireland Water last year, you know, they conducted a procurement exercise. So they have a significant suite of contractors in place to deliver the work as and when the budget is available. So, mm -hmm. so then there is a, a, a list of projects that the regulator has effectively already approved. I think mm -hmm. if you're talking over the six years, I think it's 12 large, large conurbations, I'm not sure quite what a conurbation is, but 12 large conurbations and 35 towns, smaller towns. Even if you get all the budget and even if you do all that work, that's less than half of the 160 um, challenges that the minister mentioned in the assembly the other day. So, mm -hmm. and, and we already know from our members, I think in a way, that perhaps over the last year, we haven't had as many issues as we thought we would in the sense that there have probably have been less people putting in pre-development inquiries going to Northern Ireland Water, but I certainly know that in a number of areas, say for instance Belfast, that if you put a pre-development inquiry into Northern Ireland Water, pretty much at this stage, it's a it's a no. There's no capacity. Um, 
we have engaged with Northern Ireland Water, um, and people like Gary Curran, who you're, you're probably familiar with on their developer um, side around some solutions engineering that can be done on certain sites. I know that's obviously some a company very particular to your consistency, Rainwater, are yeah. working in, in Lima Valley to do work like that, where you can you can put in a stormwater offset, uh, which may unlock development at a site. Uh, in the absence of updating a wastewater treatment works. But I think those solutions are very, very bespoke to almost individual towns. It depends mm -hmm. on a town. It depends on where the development is, where the wastewater system is, topography and various such things. So while our members will do that and they will do that at their at expense to them, um, it, it really comes back to what John Irvine said in the previous session, it's, it's, it's budget availability. Yeah, and getting a flat line budget and um, one year um, budget is proven challenging for every department, obviously, and this department as well. Can I just ask one further question? And the, the chair has sort of picked up on this because I'm conscious when the Mineral, the Mineral Production Association, when they attended a meeting uh, with ourselves, they highlighted their concerns about the plan system here in the north in general and then they they were talking about planning applications and the time frame on major projects and whilst there is an indicative time of 30 weeks for approval or turnaround that it takes 54 weeks and sometimes even longer um, to deliver the major projects so it goes, it goes into the issue that you spoke about uh, in relation to the review of the planning act a 10 year old act or whatever under review and we're the same in a little bit concerned that this is getting light touch as opposed to um the kind of attention that it needs so what do you think could be improved within the planning system to address the planning application process to help the industry as a whole uh, moving forward I, th I think certainly one of the things which which was brought in with the act was, was pre-application discussions for major projects um, the, councils have been good at, at, at engaging in pre-application discussions, but there's there's no real obligation on statutory consultees to engage at that early stage. So, uh, you, you know, you if you want to go in with a with a with a say a fifty unit housing development uh, in in Derry, and you go and talk to Derry and Straban Council, they will probably tell you yes, the land's zoned, yes, there's a housing need, but. You still you won't really fully comprehend what the statutory consultees think. So you then start preparing public consultation, um, and you you get into a pre-application community consultation exercise, where at that point then statutory consultees start telling you there's problems or that you don't really find out for a long time what the problems are, um, and then it becomes quite a tense exchange. Uh, in terms of getting the information to a point where you can actually submit a planning application to the council for its consideration. So pre-application discussions would be, I think, something that we would be keen to see bulked up uh, in terms of, you know, our members are very willing to engage in them and, and there is good evidence of them working where people are bought into them. Um, I, I, I mean, I know what was said on the committee earlier on about the, the changes that were brought in as a result of the pandemic to moving to online and remote consultation temporarily. I think we would like to see that brought in permanently along with public events when the time allows, because certainly the, the feedback we have had is that the engagement does seem to be better. Um, people seem to be feeling, you know, if you're, if you're actually giving people the opportunity to, to read materials at their leisure instead of being, you know, walk around a room and told to leave comments in the way out. It, 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 it does seem to be more engaging. I am on the Ministerial Engagement Planning Engagement Partnership looking at pre-application consultations. So that will hopefully have some exercises with the public over the next few while. So that will be, will be interesting to see what that brings forward. Um, but yes, certainly work around the statutory consultees and how we can get them to respond faster, but equally make sure that what they are responding with is substantive. Um, mm. And if that means that on some occasions you have to lengthen the time that they're allowed because an application is particularly complex, then yeah, look, I, I think we would we would understand that. But certainly at the minute, the statutory timeframes just, just do not work. Okay, David, that's really helpful.
maybe we can pick up with the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and uh, we'll give Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, members, can I just draw your attention to the fact that we need to leave this room by one o'clock? I have five further members have indicated, so I would really appreciate it if you could make your questions um, fairly succinct um, to allow all members to get an opportunity to speak. Um, Ms Kimmins. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. Um, thanks uh, to, to you both for, for your presentation. Um, in the briefing, it cites that during the second half of 2020, the turnover was still 20-25% down from the previous year. Has there been any change since then? Or is that still the general position of the industry? Yeah. So, so the situation was, if we took last year in total, turnover would be down around 20 to 25 percent. So that really reflects the earlier part of the year. In the second part of the year, the industry was probably working at above capacity to make up for lost time. Um, worrying uh, message from our members very clearly now in the new year is that activity levels are dropping quickly. Tender opportunities from the public sector are, are not in abundance and the commercial market and we're thinking there really of retail hospitality student accommodation all of those opportunities are, are thin on the ground if you you know I, I think you can be uh, misled sometimes as you, you drive around the country and you see cranes and we do talk about the crane kind there are a lot of cranes in belfast but you, you bear in mind those cranes are on sites which were commissioned a number of years ago and they will be completed um, the real worry now is if we project forward two years, there may not be any cranes on the, on the horizon because we, we see a dearth of work. So no, our, our members are very anxious, very anxious about pipeline. A uh, clear message we get from them consistently is public sector work is now paramount uh, and visibility of that pipeline is essential for them to retain confidence. Yeah, I suppose that, and even speaking to tradesmen locally, um, that is something I've noticed that there has been a drop. There seemed to be a bit of a boom maybe over the summer and, and, and on, but then from it seems to be drying up, which is very worrying. And you warn of the absence of a quality indicator um, with respect to tender scoring and its ability to drive the market down um, to unsustainability unsustainably low pricing um, with reference to the current downturn of the market. Just can you elaborate a wee bit more on that and what that would mean for the industry, Mark? Y yes, we can. Uh, this wouldn't be a point specifically for DFI because DFI tenders very often do include a quality assessment, but when a tender is submitted, there will, there will be a price for the, the scope of works and there will also be what's called a quality submission, which uh, is a response to questions asked of the contractors around how they will deliver the works. Uh, the, the team that will deliver them the programme of work. So it gives the client a great deal of confidence that they're appointing a high caliber uh, contractor to deliver the works and contractors will compete uh, on that basis. And there'll be a percentage of marks for the award of contract given to price and a percentage given to quality and that, that can vary. But if we remove any assessment of the, the competence and quality of the contractors and purely go on price, then it becomes driven by price. And these circumstances today, where there's actually a dearth of work, it's behavioural that the pricing will go downwards in a spiral. We have seen this behaviour before. It doesn't end well. It doesn't end well for contractors. It doesn't end well for clients, frankly, either. The quality can suffer in extremis. Contractors can go bust midway through a project, giving other other concerns. So it is something, and you might be aware, I, I sit on the, the new procurement board, and, and it is an app red line for the yeah, procurement board that we must get a quality assessment back across all public sector spending and prevent us going into this downward spiral of pricing only. Yeah, okay, no, thank you. Um, and just my last point, I suppose I noted that, that the Federation concurs with um, the Finance Minister's position with respect to getting um, additional fiscal flexibility was, um, in terms of our capital budget including uh, and their carryover. It was just to try, can you touch on a wee bit what that would mean for the industry? Um, because I think if we're able to put, you know, if we were able to possess those sort of financial powers and, you know, what sort of potential benefits multi-year budgets could bring to construction here. And I think um, in light of, of what you've described, Mark, and, and the situation we are in presently, it would be interesting to hear how that might help. Yes, I mean, the, the multi-year budgeting, I think, would be essential. I mean, we, we talk about one-year budgeting at the moment, and even that's a misnomer. You know, we're sitting here at, at the start of March, and, and we're aware from a number of government clients that they won't actually have their budget set until May or June 
of the year in which the budget's being spent. So you're, you're actually talking about eight or nine months budgets, which mm -hmm. is difficult for the client. Uh, 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 we, don't, we don't blame the clients. This is a systematic problem with the way budgets are, are dealt with uh, locally, but it, it's very difficult for contractors then as well. Um, we already responded to a question asking around how we prioritize what tenders we bid for. Very difficult to know when you, you don't actually have the visibility of a pipeline of what's coming. So a, a more prompt uh, budget setting process, uh, which could give us a, a pipeline of work would be welcome on a single year basis, but multi-year budgeting would really open open the opportunity for more efficient and effective use of public funding as well. And we're very conscious, whilst all work is welcome, we are very conscious in industry at the end of the year, you tend to get a rush of works which may not be the most strategically viable. We're, we're grateful for all that may not be the best way to spend the money in a rush at the end of the year. And if there was a longer planning window, that, that's got to be more effective. Yeah. Okay. Like, thank you both. Um, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And, and uh, Mark and David, thank you very much. Just a couple of points. Obviously, the brief shows that the Federation State of Trade Survey covering the second half of last year, 2020, 79% have experienced delays in supply chains as a result of COVID. Um, can you update us on those figures and, and where are you in terms of the, today's circumstances around the... Um, yeah, so those figures, as you rightly say, they were they were collected uh, in early January, uh, at that point in time, which was an acute point in time and, and not just for construction. I think all, all uh, areas of, of commerce were finding it difficult to appear. We don't have a... a replica stat, if you like, for today's situation, but anecdotally, we believe that situation has calmed down very significantly, uh, but a lot of work has been done by the industry, by wholesalers, by suppliers, uh, to reroute and realign and reconfigure their supply chains. So I think we're less concerned about the logistics today, but as, as David uh, mentioned earlier, we, we still retain concerns about pricing. Uh, and about the cost of supply chains, which has undoubtedly risen and may yet settle, but will in all likelihood settle higher than it was previously. So, um, and, and see, yes, obviously as part of the budget process yesterday, I mean, the, we've had a standstill budget here for this year. And I mean, I see recently there are the Austria University economies, uh, economists were saying about this uh, very challenging fund and settlement for this year. So, I mean, in relation to yourselves in the construction sector, what does that mean for yourselves? I'd say we, we've seen a, a slight increase in, in the capital budget, which is which is very welcome. But at a time when public sector, if you like, is, is the main show in town now, whilst the, the commercial sector has very much gone quiet, we, we, we would very much welcome increased budgets wherever those are possible. Um, the, the problem we see is, uh, again, the window and the time frame this budget and we don't know the budget to follow this one and whether that will be maybe higher maybe lower we don't know so again it, it's all around the the visibility uh, of how that will be spent and the pipelines which we will not see now maybe for some months from some of the government clients so uh, members will be asking us today what what is what is the pipeline we, we don't truly know and we know that again the clients are working very hard on that but it can't come quick enough uh, to give confidence to the market it's it's all back to the single year budgeting process. I mean, you have to admit, Mark. The multi I know there was a lot of debate yesterday in the chamber, but multi year budgets and, and that's something that that obviously exactly we need to look, take a look at. But just David, just back to yourself, because I think we need a further discussion. The 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 review of plan, and I think it is a major. It should be a major strategic review right across the board. And um, there are some good elements. I mean, I, I was part of the whole process. We introduced the PSA, the pack pre-application or the pod sorry pre-application discussions they're very good and uh, obviously down a different route but, but but i think in general um to try and get rid of the delays and i mean the start of the agency in response in my experience they've held up the process as well and i appreciate what you're saying but but we need a strategic look right across the board in terms of trying to cut out the delays and and anything you can offer in terms of that um, and, and and maybe i'll follow up with you that's from some of our party colleagues in relation to, to having a chat about that because I, I think we need to seriously look at that to try and move move that whole process on because delays are not helping any of us and uh, I sit in another committee and, and we've seen some of the audit reports and how the delays and, and the consequences of all that and we need a broader 
a broader discussion, but I think the planning, in this committee's point of view, certainly a review of the planning is one of the key elements as well, and we, we need to discuss that further. But listen, thanks very much for your presentation. I know all the members want to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mark and David. Just two questions briefly on furlough. You referred to furlough about 82 per cent expect to return workers after furlough. What's your numbers roughly? Do you have any idea numbers of people that's on furlough in, that, in your whole 30,000 industries you refer to? Uh, we, we don't have up to date numbers, but the one thing to be very mindful of is that, that furlough obviously applies to direct employees of construction companies, but in actual fact there are very many more self-employed individuals working in construction who would not be availing of furlough and, and will be feeling the pressure more than the, the, the directly employed uh, labour and construction, but the figure is relatively upbeat. What I would say is the construction industry does operate very lean, and, and after a number of years uh, of underinvestment uh, and a depressed local market for construction, construction companies do not carry extra staff a, a, as a rule, so the, the level of further reflects the fact that those businesses are all already operating uh, very lean. Just a final question regarding a where would, the, where would the work be in those firms, those um, 800 member companies that you're referring to, that you look after? What percentage of the work would be here in Northern Ireland or indeed across the water or away or, or elsewhere? So what percentage of work is here in Northern Ireland, roughly? The, the majority of our are working locally, uh, but we have a very significant number. We, we reckon about 25 to 30 percent of our members have active work in GB and a similar number, if not higher, uh, in the Republic. So Northern Ireland Construction is one of the, the unsung export heroes, I think, in Northern Ireland. We, we've been very successful uh, at, at selling our services uh, in both markets, and we're very keen to continue to do so and remove any barriers that would prevent us from that. Uh, if I can just very quickly just come in on that, I mean, we actually we are we are giving evidence to the the finance committee on on this this afternoon. There is, you know, as Mark said, there is a great success in our membership over the last decade in the export market, and particularly, uh, I mean, the Republic has picked up a lot in the last few years, but particularly over the last decade, it's it's been Great Britain. Um, one of the things though, that we are concerned about is. That and predominantly as a consequence of the of the, of the procurement enhanced procurement freedom brought about by by Brexit, the, the cabinet office, predominantly for England, have brought in for under threshold procurement the ability for English local authorities to restrict procurement competitions to firms based uh, in that locality. Um, that is the kind of procurement regionalism that we just do not want to see take hold. Um, competition, as far as we're concerned, is a, is a, is a very good thing. And um, this kind of... <sighs> the, 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 there's been an in, in, in injection now of this, this issue around procurement, about the local element of it. And the definition of local, as far as we're concerned, um, could be quite restrictive if it is very, very clearly applied. Now, that Captain Office Guide does not apply in Northern Ireland, it's very important to say. But certainly, you know, we and through some of our sister organisations in Britain, you know, we are being very clear that this, this isn't something we want to see grow um, because it, it limits contractors' ability to make work. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Unfortunately, Mr. Muir's had to, to leave. Mr. Beggs. Uh, hello there, uh, Mark. And David. Again, thanks for your presentation. Two subject areas to uh, try and cover very briefly. Um, you indicate a preference for a stream of wastewater treatment work rather than a flood and then a, a, a dearth. Um, so, my question would be. And bear in mind, I, I'm aware of some local companies that would have specialised in that type of work who have taken on contracts in GB. So you think there would be better value for the public money and more uh, returns of tender and competition if there is that uh, uh, ongoing work rather than a big splash? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah, you mean if you have a relatively even spread of your capital budget across, say, a six-year period, 
um, then that that will help. Uh, it will help the contractors know what they're likely to be gearing up for, and and then consequently gearing down. Uh, with with regard to the Northern Ireland water piece specifically, as we said, they have a, a suite of contractors they already have procured to basically deliver the majority of those works over a six year period. Now, within that, there might be many tenders among some of those contractors for, say, some of the larger projects. But you know, see, so that's that's an advantage that you have. As long as you have the budget, you've got pretty good certainty you're going to get the money spent because there's a, a suite of projects to be delivered. And equally, there's there's no real issue really about things like procurement challenges coming up on some of these some of these projects. But you know, making sure that it's spread out evenly and that contractors understand long in advance well, what you know what what portion of it they're going to get. And when that's very, very important to making sure that you maximize the efficiency of your spend. I mean, we have often heard before, I think people in TFI Roads have said that on the road maintenance budget, the, the annual one year budgets have about a 20% efficiency loss. You know, so if you have an 100 million pound budget, you can effectively say that 20 million of that won't be on the ground. In a, in a one-year budget cycle, I mean, it, it's it, it's it's a it's a bonkers way to run the system. But those are the confines in which uh, the executive, I suppose, has to manage public expenditure. Clearly, a problem that needs to address. So, second area, then, in terms of the the planning review, David, I think you indicated concerns about some of the planning conditions that were set, and you mentioned that they had to be delivered even before the the groundworks. Groundworks. I take it you're talking about the main, the the roads going into the infrastructure. Can you give examples of the sort of uh, planning c uh, conditions you think are unreasonable that have to be implemented at a very early stage? This does require investment up, up front very early. Yeah, so some of the things that have come up over the last few years are things around you know, the number of street lights that need to be put in before you can move on to a new phase of, a, say, a housing scheme. So say that you have, have approval for 50 units, but it's being done in three phases where before you move from phase one to phase two, you have to have all the street lights in for phase two. And it's it's conditioned that you can't do any work until these conditions are met. And it, it just seems, you know, these are the kind of things contractors, and I know there have been historical issues about unadopted roads and unadopted, you know, and of this predecessors of this committee, the ODRD committee, did inquiries into this many, many years ago. And there might be some element of gestation in this from that, you know, but making sure that contractors build what they are supposed to build. But, you know, invariably, as far as we are concerned, these are the kind of conditions which can be discharged while the houses, for instance, are being built. They don't have to be discharged before the houses are built. Um, so it, 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 it slows up progress in sites when we have a very particular housing need here uh, of all types. So the, 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 those are probably the ones that are the most um, prevalent and have probably come up the most, I would say, over the last six years. It's this kind of sense that you can't do any of the main works until you discharge all of the conditions. Our view would be that you can discharge a lot of the conditions while you're doing the main works. Would you accept that um, the public would need greater confidence that the work will definitely occur? And I, I can think, for example, uh, one one set of roads that were adopted 18 years after people moved in um, because of various difficulties. But if there was faster um, uh, drawing down of road spawns and uh, solve issues like that, uh, the public might have greater confidence that they may uh, allow a greater degree of flexibility. Do you accept that that has to happen at the same time? Yeah, you know, but I mean, obviously going back to that, that those inquiries that the DRD committee did a decade ago about unadopted roads and such, like, you know, yes, uh, the bonds, the 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 wastewater water bonds, the road bonds, they they need to, you know, they they should be at a sufficient level in order to make sure that if a contractor goes into administration, that the the relevant authority, be it Northern Ireland Water, be it DFI Roads, that there is enough money in that bond to complete the works. I suppose one thing we would say is, you know, the calculation of those bonds is out of our members' hands. You know, so it is incumbent on those authorities who, who ask for the bond to be presented that they are they can stand over that the bond is sufficient to meet the requirements 
of, of what needs to be done to make sure, say, a road can be adopted. Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, our members, I mean, we may have questions about how some of the bonds are calculated, but at the same time, in order to make sure that the, the projects are finished out to the standard they should be, um, how they are calculated is not something that we can influence. That's something that they say Northern Ireland Water or DFI roads. It's, it's what they set. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Mark and David. No one else now has indicated, but can, and I, can I thank you for your presentation this morning? And unfortunately, you did invite us down the route of planning, um, which maybe was a little bit of a distraction from what you had originally wanted to speak to us about. I am always reluctant to ask people to do more work than they're already doing, but I appreciate that you will be doing um, a, a response to the consultation on. Um, planning review anyway, and I think probably the committee would really very much appreciate it if you could make that into a paper for us, um, because it might be useful for us in our deliberations. If that's okay for you, to for me yeah. to ask you to do that, if that's more okay. Than okay, no, very yeah, much appreciate that. that. Okay, thank thank you both of you. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, members, if you can tell, I appreciate that they were they're going to the finance committee this afternoon, but I think it might be useful. Given um, what they presented to us, that we may be right to the finance committee um, to be forwarded on to the finance minister, just the issues that they have raised, and, and also if, if committee members are content that we also um, send this through to our own minister for consideration. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving then to um, the next item, which is item ten. Um, forward work program. Just draw your attention to that at page 135. Um, obviously, the next next week we are receiving a briefing from um, the department in relation to reservoirs, and that um, that meeting starting at 10 o'clock. And uh, obviously, in, is in closed session. We'll receive the papers on the morning, and then they'll be taken away after the presentation. If members do want to see the papers in advance of that, if they want to come early. Um, there, there will be a, a chance, perhaps maybe for half an hour or so before the meeting commences. Um, you'll only be able to receive sight of the papers if you're here in person. So, um, and obviously we were we were mindful of that when we agreed to to have this session um, several weeks ago. So, if members can bear that in mind, I'm also conscious of the fact that we haven't heard um, from the minister for quite some time. So maybe if members are content that we maybe um, ask for her to come after Easter recess, a um, week or so after that, um, just to get an, an update on a number of issues, because we, we have had various issues that have been um, outstanding that we are con continuing to um, correspond with to her with. So it might be useful to meet with her in person if members are content to do that. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, do members have any other issues that they want to raise either under forward work program or under any other business at this stage? Okay. No. Great. Thank you. Well, the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. next Wednesday, the 10th of March, in the Senate Chamber. And as I've advised that all members need to be here um, in order to access the papers. So, if members are content, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern